about to give the court to be the truth, so help you God. Okay, please have a seat in the witness stand. Repeat your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Paul Greer, G-R-E-E-R. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. Take a moment to unpack yourself if you need to. Paul, if you would, uh, please introduce yourself to the jury and tell us a little bit when you graduated high school and where you went for education. Sure. Um, my name is Paul Greer. I am originally from the upstate of South Carolina, went to school um, and graduated high school in 2009. Um, upon graduating high school, I attended the University of South Carolina and uh, received a Bachelor's of Science in Biological Sciences from the University of South Carolina. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to pull that microphone a little closer so we can all hear you. Yes, sir. No, thank you. All right, Paul, walk us through a little bit about your career. With whom are you currently employed? I'm employed at the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, which is commonly known as SLED. All right, and tell us a little bit about your professional career. How did you get started at SLED and uh, what is it that you do there? Yes, sir. Um, after uh, completing my Bachelor of Science at USC, I uh, began an internship at SLED in the Forensic Services Laboratory. I specifically did that internship with our Fire and Tool Mark Department. Um, I interned there for several months and ultimately um, achieved a position there in that unit. Um, I began my employment officially at SLED in March of 2014 in the Firearms Department, um, where I began uh, training to become a Firearms Examiner. All right, and are you currently employed as a firearms examiner uh, with SLED? Yes, sir. All right, uh, Paul, Mr. Greer, if you would, walk us through what that required in order to become a firearms examiner. Sure. In order to become a firearms examiner, there's a lot of extensive training on the job that must be conducted. Um, at SLED, I began an in-house training program that we refer to as the Fireman Toolmark Course of Instruction. Um, during this time, again, it was extensive, approximately three years or so. Um, I assisted other examiners who were qualified on the job, um, prepped their cases. I learned how to work those cases. I looked at thousands of um, fired ammunition components on the microscope and did many comparisons of those. Um, during that time, I also completed multiple written and practical examinations. Um, at the conclusion of that uh, training program, I was given a comprehensive final exam. That included some mock casework within our laboratory. Um, I successfully completed all of that training in that mock casework and was able to begin working cases on my own. Our forensic, our, in addition to the comprehensive uh, qualifications and testing required to become a forensic examiner, are forensic examiners and SLED also subject to yearly uh, testing as well? Yes, sir. Um, we do the competency um, at the conclusion of our training program. Um, but we also participate in proficiency testing each year um, within uh, an area in our discipline. Um, so that is completed. I complete a proficiency test each year. And that just uh, assures that we're maintaining our competency. Thank you. Paul, are you a member of any um, professional organizations? Yes, sir, I am. And which, ones would that, which one would that be? I'm a member of the Association of Firemen Toolmark Examiners, um, which is also known as AFTI. Have you had any opportunity to attend additional trainings or conferences uh, under the umbrella of firearms and tool mark uh, examinations? Yes, sir, I have. Could you explain a couple of those or a few of those uh, if you would? Yes, sir. AFTI um, hosts an annual conference each year. And AFTI, uh, I might add, is an international organization. Uh, it's a group of firearms and tool mark examiners around the world, as well as other scientists and members from um, the academic, academic world. Um, we get together each year, and I attend that when I'm able, in order to share information and, and see what's happening within the field of firearm and tool mark examination. I've attended several of those conferences, and I've also attended some regional conferences that have been hosted um, by the FBI laboratory in Quantico. And uh, speaking of the laboratory, is your laboratory um, accredited? Yes, sir, it is. And what is the accreditation it, it operates under? Um, the SLED laboratory is accredited under ANAB. Um, that is a, a, a national organization that follows um, ISO 17025 standards, and those are international standards. 
So our laboratory is um, operating at this, within the same set of standards as other labs in the United States that are accredited with ANAB and also those who follow the ISO 17025. And in order to maintain accreditation, are there, is there an inspection process that ANAB requires? Yes, sir. All right, and explain if you would the, the kind of the couple of inspections that, that are typically required. In order to maintain our accreditation, um, we have a visit approximately every four years. Auditors come in to the laboratory to um, check our casework, review our files, make sure that we're operating within those standards, and they, uh, they watch us perform casework. That's a big, huge component, and they do this for all the disciplines within the laboratory. And, and that audit every four years within that cycle helps to ensure that we are, we're meeting those standards. Um, internally at SLED, we also have internal audits each year. So even though um, the a and inspectors that come every four years, um, we may not see them e every year. There is some type of audit being performed within our departments and in our casework each year. Thank you. Does the SLED laboratory operate under a uh, policies and procedures guideline for the overall agency? Yes, sir, we do. All right, and explain a little bit about how that involves the lab. Correct. Um, SLED in general has a, a large set of policies that we must adhere to. Within the laboratory, um, each department has a manual that they must follow that gives them information on how to conduct their everyday um, work and how to perform casework. Um, additionally, and following the um, ANAB accreditation, um, we have a SLED quality manual that is uh, specifically for the laboratory. Um, we must follow that as well. And those are all guidelines to help us um, within to conduct casework. And in addition to the SLED quality assurance manual, there's, there's, would there additionally be a SLED firearms department manual that you have to comply with? Yes, sir. There is a, a, firearms, uh, excuse me, a firearms manual that we must uh, follow. Okay. Just very briefly, please explain what that involves. Yes, sir. Um, that, that, again, is just a, a document that gives us information on how to conduct our day-to-day uh, -day casework, um, what to do um, with evidence, how we should examine that. Um, it also gives us information into our training program, um, any type of uh, calibration or measurement um, references that we need to consult for our equipment that we use. All of that information is contained within that manual that we um, have to follow and can reference. All right, and if you would, please explain uh, to the jury what firearms identification, generally the subject matter, what that is. Sure. Um, firearms identification is a discipline in forensic science um, where our main objective each day is to examine those fired ammunition components. So imagine a fired cartridge case or a fired bullet, and we're looking at those in order to determine if they were fired by a specific firearm. Thank you. Um, how long, and how long, again, had you, have you been working in SLED, in the SLED laboratory? I've been employed in the firearms department at SLED for almost nine years. And have you had an opportunity to testify in, in court such as this? I have. Would that be uh, both state and federal courts? I have testified in state and federal courts, yes, sir. Okay. Approximately how many times, or do you know how many times? Um, approximately 27 times, yes, sir. Your Honor, at this point, state moves to admit uh, Mr. Greer as a firearms and tool mark examination expert. Your Honor, no objections to his qualification. He's so qualified. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Greer, I'd, I'd like to take the moment to kind of uh, educate the jury a little bit on firearms. Yes, sir. And if you would, please please tell us a little bit about the, uh, well, first of all, are you familiar with the two kind of cartridge rounds we're, we're going to primarily be talking about today? Yes, sir. And are you familiar with the two kind of uh, firearms we're going to generally be talking about today? Yes, sir. All right. If you would, please give us a little, uh, an intro to firearms, uh, beginning with perhaps a shotgun. Tell us what makes that a unique type of firearm and how it generally operates. Yes, sir. Um, in general, a firearm is a mechanism that uh, propels a projectile through the combustion of gunpowder. Um, as as uh, he was stating, there are several different types of firearms, and one of them um, is a shotgun. Um, a shotgun, if you, if you imagine, is a long gun, um, typically that is designed to be fired from the shoulder. I mean, that has a smooth bore. And what the bore is, it's just the inside of that barrel. So there's no rifling inside that barrel, typically. Um, a shotgun is also uh, different than um, maybe a handgun that you may be familiar with. And it fires shot shells. 
And, and a shot shell is a, a cartridge, if you will, that could be plastic or metal that can contain multiple projectiles or a single projectile. And when you said uh, barrel, smooth bore, and rifling, would, would rifling mean sort of the interior of the, the barrel where the bullet exits is spiraled inside? Correct. That rifling um, is in barrels in order to give a bullet that's traveling down that barrel its rotary twist and, and spin so that way it can uh, travel to a target or its destination. And does that rifling assist in the bullet traveling in a straight line consistently? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The rifling, spinning the bullet, making it go out, does that allow it to travel in a straight line? Uh, yes, that rifling that's inserted into that barrel, um, if you'll think of kind of like a quarterback throwing a football, it helps it give it that nice spiral so that it, it can fall, travel um, more efficiently. And, and kind of the uh, opposite of that would be the smooth bore of a shotgun. How does that affect the uh, pellets or the BBs inside of the shotgun? Um, so in the sh a typical shotgun, you don't have that rifling that gives it that spin or twist, but that's not the design of the shotgun. Um, so when those pellets are, are a slug or whatever is traveling down the board of that shotgun, um, it is just traveling out the barrel um, based on uh, the combustion from it firing. Okay. And if you would please describe to us what type of ammunition a shotgun will shoot. Um, typically, um, you, you use a shot shell. Um, that can be uh, made of some type of plastic, typically we see that, with some type of metal head on it. Inside that uh, shot shell, um, there can be multiple projectiles. Um, you hear of pellets, um, we, we think of birdshot, buckshot, that's what would be inside of a shot shell. Also in there, there may be other components um, that could be plastic or um, some type of paper material, and that would be a wad. And those have different uh, jobs within a shot shell. Those can be to protect the pellets, um, to keep them together as they travel, to provide some type of cushioning between those pellets and um, the powder. Um, so they all have different various purposes within, inside that shot shell. And, uh, Mr. Greer, did you bring with you some demonstrative items to kind of just demonstrate generically what you're talking about in a shot shell? Yes, sir. All right, can I, can I see that real quick? Yes, sir. Yes. <coughs> Greer, if you would, uh, begin with the shot shells. Uh, you brought some demonstrative exhibits, is that correct? That's correct. If you would, just please hold them up, show them to the jury, and explain what it is we see, when we're, what we're looking at, and what, what the components are in there. Sure. Um, again, these are just two examples of a shot shell. Um, here you have a plastic uh, body there of the shell with a metal head. On this end of it, that is uh, the end that's going to be up against the breech face of the firearm. And in the middle, you'll see um, a small circle. That's the primer area, and that's what's going to be struck by a firing pin in a firearm so that um, it will fire. That's what's going to detonate inside the shot shell to cause it to, to be fired. Um, out this end, you see it's crimped on, on this end. This is the end that the uh, projectiles or the pellets that are inside of the shot shell will exit and travel uh, down the barrel of that shotgun. Thank you. All right, Mr. Greer, the second firearm uh, would be, if you would, talk about a little bit about what the AR platform is. Sure. An AR platform is something that um, is commonly seen uh, throughout America. Um, originally, it was designed by Armalite, and it's just a modular uh, platform, and it's a rifle, a semi-automatic rifle in its, in its normal state, and that's what we have here today. Okay. And what would be the more common caliber that you might find on the air, our platform? Yes, sir. Um, typically, uh, what is very common um, that we see in the laboratory and uh, that you may be more familiar with 
um, is it's uh, chambered in 223 Remington caliber 5.56 NATO. Um, that is a very common caliber for an AR-15 uh, type firearm. Okay. And um, what were some of the items that you examined in the case as far as rifle calibers? In this case, I received uh, one rifle, and it was um, chambered in 300 blackout caliber. All right, explain to us what the 300 blackout round is and maybe how it's, it's similar and uh, different from a 5.56 round NATO. Sure. Um, again, you may be familiar with the 223 Remington or 5.56 NATO caliber. Um, the 300 blackout uh, cartridge is, is sort of similar to that. Um, when that was designed, it, it was designed so that it could be used with a lot of the original um, features of an AR-15. Um, so the overall dimensions of those cartridges are, are very similar, with the exception of a shorter case length and a much um, heavier or larger bullet. And uh, 300 blackout being a, a, re a relatively, at least compared to 5.56 NATO round, um, were some of the components interchangeable on the AR platform? Um, it's my understanding that when that 300 blackout caliber was developed, um, it was designed so that some of the components from the original um, AR-15 type that were chambered in the 5.56 NATO or the 223 Remington could be used with a 300 blackout. And it is possible, maybe not ideal, but possible to use a um, magazine that would be formatted for the 223 5.56 round in a 300 blackout rifle. Yes, sir, I would say it's possible. And did you bring um, any 223 and 556 and 300 blackout rounds with you today for demonstrative purposes? Yes, sir, I have two. All right, would you please uh, identify the two and uh, tell us uh, what we're looking at and what, what the similarities and differences would be? Sure. Um, to start off, this is an example of a 223 Remington. Um, this is the one that you may be more familiar with. Um, I will show you now, um, side by side, this is the 300 blackout. Um, and I'm trying to do this so you can see. Um, you can see that their overall dimensions there are a little larger. I mean, excuse me, are about the same, except some, with the exception of the larger bullet. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of anatomy here of, of the cartridge. Um, what we would refer to as um, this item right here is an unfired cartridge. Um, terminology in our firearms department is, is very uh, key to us in being accurate in what we do. Um, so we would refer to this as an unfired cartridge. Um, that contains a bullet which is this portion right here, this copper-colored um, projectile, and that's what's going to travel down the barrel of the firearm towards the target. Um, again, on this end, just like the shot shell, there's a primer there in the middle. Um, you see the circle object there, um, and that's what the firing pin is going to strike so that way the, it can detonate and uh, cause the cartridge to be fired. Um, when it's fired, um, we'll have a cartridge case which is just the brass colored um, portion here. And that is the cylindrical component there that holds it all together. It holds the primer, the bullet, and the gunpowder inside of it. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Mm -hmm. Permission to approach, just yes, for sir. demonstrative purposes, I'm gonna put it on the uh, helmet. Mr. Greer, if you would just pay attention, you have a little video screen there. Let's see if this will work. Yes, sir, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to work. <laughs> All right, can you see them clearly? Uh, yes, sir, I can. Right. <laughs> What's the big black thing on the screen? Um, <laughs> appears to be a phone. <laughs> <laughs> In your expertise, that's a phone. Um, the two rounds we see there, uh, the top round, can you identify which one that is? Um, the one that is uh, up against the foam there would be the 300 blackout caliber uh, cartridge. And then, uh, as you said before, the below, the round below that would be the uh, 223 slash 556 round. Yes, sir. And uh, seeing the actual projectile, meaning the item that exits the barrel of the rifle, would that be that tip, uh, the cylindrical tip on the top? Uh, yes, sir. And I believe, if I remember correctly, both of those projectiles were uh, copper in color, if you can distinguish that on the, the screen. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I'll ask that the, uh, 
as compared to each other, does the, five, the 300 blackout have a higher grain typically than the 556? It's possible. Um, the bullets come in different grain weights, so that is a much larger bullet, so um, I would expect it to be heavier. And when we're, we are going to hear about grain weights. Could you explain what that means also? Sure. Uh, grain is a, a term that we use in firearms, and it's just a, a unit of measurement. Um, so when we measure our projectiles, we are going to measure those in grains. And just as a common um, way to relate to that, um, if you imagine 7,000 grains, uh, that's equip equivalent to approximately a pound. Thank you. So measurements in bullets are done in grains, basically. Yes, sir. That's what we refer to them in. Going back to shotgun shells very briefly, are there various types of shotgun shells and gauges or calibers? Yes, sir, there are. Could you explain a couple of the types that you might commonly find and then uh, just some of the calibers so we know what we're talking about? Um, sure. Some of the more common gauges in shot shell, and gauge is just uh, referring to the size and how we um, are able to determine what that firearm is chambered in. So um, a 12 gauge is something that's very common. Um, that's a very common shotgun that I would expect to encounter. Um, you may also have heard of or be familiar with a 20 gauge. Um, that's another one that may be common. Or, or 410 bore, which is, is a type of shot shell as well. Um, those are some of the more common ones that we uh, would see in our laboratory setting and that you may be familiar with. Um, again, throughout those, um, there are all different kinds of shot shells loaded with different projectiles, um, loaded with birdshot, loaded with buckshot, and they all um, will serve a purpose within, um, within their own respect. Um, but those can have multiple projectiles, hundreds of projectiles. It could have just one large projectile, which we refer to as a slug. Um, so there's lots of uh, options, if you will, uh, within a shot shell. And all those of this may be obvious. A buckshot is typically used to hunt what type of game? Um, I'm not hunting often, <laughs> um, but I would expect a buckshot could be used for something, um, you know, as it suggests, a, a buck. Um, you would expect maybe a larger animal. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a hunter, but that's where I could imagine that. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Before we move on, um, and, and, and speaking about the uh, <clears throat> area of forensic science of firearm examinations, is that an area that is uh, subject to peer review? Yes, sir. And uh, could you explain to us what that means? What's the peer review process and, and why that's important in forensic science? Sure. Um, within firearms and tool mark um, examination, this is something that's been around for years. Um, firearms examiners have been uh, learning about uh, the firearms identification process, building uh, studies and designs and experiments throughout um, many years. And it's part of that process in, in designing those studies and doing this research um, within firearms and tool mark, they're going to uh, draft an experiment, conduct an experiment, um, publish an article on their findings, and, and during that process, um, there can be review, um, and there will be review of, of the article of the experiment, where other scientists um, within our field or other scientists or, or researchers can examine that and see what was going on during that process and say whether they agree with it um, and share their comments, and that's part of that peer review process. Um, we, as an AFTI member, I have access to our AFTI journal, where a lot of those peer review articles um, are published and they're able uh, for other examiners to, to look at, for other scientists and researchers to look at and, and, and help uh, b bolster or their opinions and thoughts on, on firearms identification. And personally, do you know how many exams you've done, you've conducted? I do not have a number of examinations that I've conducted while at SLED. Um, however, at this point, I would say it's somewhere in the thousands. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to uh, ask you, did you um, receive uh, a, a, a volume of items uh, concerning this case for review? Yes, sir. I did receive um, several items to examine um, in this case. And generally, did you uh, have an opportunity, we're going to go through those items very shortly, but did you have an opportunity to, in general, review a significant amount of items for um, identification, possible identification? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you pre prepare a report in, after uh, conducting these examinations? Yes, sir, I did prepare a report. 
All right, I'm going to ask us if we would go through a number of items very shortly. Um, do you have a copy report and is it needed in order to uh, refresh your memory and be able to specifically recall each individual item? Uh, yes, sir. I do have a copy and um, I would appreciate being able to refer to it. Okay, very good. And prior to your testimony today, have you had an opportunity to, to uh, well, first of all, generally when items are submitted, do you know anything about the case? Um, generally when items are submitted to the SLED laboratory, um, I do not have information about the case. I do not. Prior to today's testimony, have you familiarized yourself at least very briefly with the layout of the scene of the crime? Yes, sir, I have. And what, specifically paying attention to what on that crime scene layout? Um, I reviewed um, a crime scene layout um, in relation to where some of the marker numbers were that are listed in my report. Um, those just reference numbers, and I reviewed where those were in relation to, to the crime scene that e the evening um, where the two bodies were. And is that just to assist us when we reference item number X, Y, or one, two, or three, it, it allows us to then, you then, to testify as where that was located? Yes, sir, I can. All right, um, Agent Greer, I'm going to uh, go down the list of items, and I'd like you to identify the item that was received mm -hmm. for me, beginning with item Item numbers two through five. Is slide item two through five? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, your items two through five? Right. Did you conduct a review of that item? Uh, yes, sir. I did look at uh, sled items two through five. And when, while I find those items, if you would, please explain how you receive items in general, how you receive items in the lab, um, what the condition is when, before you review them, and then what you do ultimately with that item. Correct. Yes, sir. So as uh, items are submitted to the sled uh, laboratory, uh, those can come from agencies all over the state to include our own sled crime scene department. Um, those items are given assignments for, uh, for multiple departments depending on what the requesting agency um, is, is asking to have completed. Um, we are a full service laboratory, so sometimes the evidence has to travel through to other departments before it arrives to me in the firearms department. Um, typically, um, if you want something like latent prints or DNA to be processed on those items, it would go there first because when I get the item, I may decontaminate it or, or touch it and those uh, prints or DNA may uh, be not be relevant anymore because you would find my, me on it. Um, evidence travels throughout the laboratory to those departments and through our evidence control department. I receive those items either from those analysts or from our evidence control technicians and when I receive that item and before I begin my examination, I want to make sure that the item is uh, submitted to me in a manner that I can uh, tell that it's not been tampered with. Um, so we use a lot of heat sealed pouches. So I'll make sure those are sealed or our cardboard box that it's sealed up and I can tell that um, there's either evidence tape or initials of that sealing examiner uh, prior to me. So that way the evidence has been um, preserved in a manner that I know uh, no one has altered with it. And just so we're clear, thank you, uh, Mr. Greer. Just so we're clear, when I refer to items, sometimes I'll say items two. Does that refer to the items that you received them as, as a SLED designation? Yes, sir. Um, one other thing about the SLED laboratory, when evidence is submitted to the lab, it receives its own unique lab number that's specific to our laboratory, and it also uh, receives new um, item numbers, and that's so we can track it throughout the laboratory and um, our analysts throughout the lab can report and identify those uh, clearly. Thank you, Mr. Greer. I'm going to hand you what's been entered into evidence already as States Exhibits 63 through 68. And I believe they correlate to items 2 through 7 on your report. Would you please take a look, moment to look at these items and let me know if you're familiar with them.
When we receive these items, I do uh, mark the packaging, and I'm also looking for uh, my, my heat seal pouch, and this is how I package the evidence after I examined it. So I'm just confirming that I see some of the information on these items. Yes, sir, this appears to be um, what was submitted to the SLED laboratory as items two through seven in your state's exhibit 63 through 68. Thank you. And did you have an opportunity? I'll take those from you. Did you uh, have an opportunity to examine these items? Yes, sir, I did. If you would, please tell us what your findings were for these items. Um, I determined that each of those items, um, they were all fired um, S and B heads. I'm renewing my prior objection to the opinion testimony based upon the hearing we had, if it's for the record. Yes, sir. You may continue. I determined um, that each of those were um, one fired um, S&B head stamp, 300 blackout caliber cartridge case, um, and that was items two through seven. Um, that's what each of those items were. Mr. Greer, and the item on the uh, screen in front of you would be what's marked as States Exhibit 63. Is that representative of the collection of uh, items that you reviewed in that batch? Yes, sir. All right. There is your blackout round. Do you, do you, uh, were you able to see the head stamp on it? And I can give you back one of the items if you would. Were you able to identify the head stamp and do the manufacturer of that round was? Yes, sir, I was. All right, who was that? Um, the, the manufacturer of item, uh, items two through seven was uh, Cellier and Bellow, and you may hear that um, referred to as, as SMB. 300? Yes, sir, and head stamp 300 blackout. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm handing you what's been marked and entered into evidence already a state's exhibits 33 and 34. Jim, do you want to see this? 33 and 34, which I believe correlate to 9 and 10 on your report. Would you please uh, take a look at these items and let me know if you recognize them. Yes, sir, I do. Okay, and please tell us what they are. Um, sled item nine, which is state's exhibit um, 34, um, is a fired federal premium double alt buck uh, three inch magnum shot shell. And, and sled item 10, um, which is state's exhibit 33, is one fired Winchester dry lock number two um, 12 gauge shot shell. And uh, after your review of the scene, where were items, your items, two through seven, located? Um, after reviewing the, uh, the crime scene diagram, um, I was aware of the uh, marker numbers. Um, that those were recovered from and then reviewing that diagram is my understanding that those um, items two through seven, the 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, um, were located around or near um, the body of Margaret Murdoch. All right, and I'm referring now to your items nine and 10 states, 33 and 34, where were those at your review of the crime scene? Um, photo, uh, diagram, where were those identified and retrieved from? Um, those appear to be um, in or around the storage room area um, near the, the kennels. Thank you. I'm putting these two up on the screen. Mr. Greer, are these the items you just testified to having examined? Yes, sir, they are. Okay, thank you. Now, after right now, we're identifying a number of items. Is it uh, 
would it, would it be fair to say that we're going to go over your results then at the conclusion of the identification? Uh, yes, sir, we can. All right, referring to item states, states exhibit number four, your item number 22, would you please direct your attention to that? Yes, sir. and entered into evidence of State's Exhibit 4. Please take a look at this firearm. Let me know if you're familiar with it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this firearm is unloaded. It's safe for me to handle. I will keep it pointed in a safe direction here. Um, I'm going to look for for some of those identifying marks that I placed on on this shotgun. <coughs> yes, sir, I do recognize this shotgun. All right, tell us what that gun is. Um, this shotgun was determined to be a uh, one Benelli model Super Black Eagle 3 semi-automatic shotgun in 12 gauge with a serial number of U573210E17. Thank you. <coughs> Was there anything that accompanied State's Exhibit Number uh, Four? Uh, yes, sir. Um, also submitted uh, with that farm was an accessory, which was the sling, and um, one f unfired Federal Premium Double Alt Buck, buck three-inch uh, twelve-gauge shot shell, and one unfired Winchester Super X Game Load sixteen-gauge shot shell. Now, I think you just testified that 12 gauge, this, this shotgun is what gauge? Um, that is 12 gauge uh, shotgun. And uh, I think you just mentioned that loaded in it was a 16 gauge. Could you explain what the process was ejecting? Is that the proper gauge for that shotgun? No, sir. That, uh, this, the unfired ammunition as it was submitted to me um, was received in uh, another package. Um, I did not remove it from that firearm. However, a 16 gauge would not be uh, correct for use in, in that firearm. Did you have to manually uh, remove it from the, from the shotgun? It was already removed when I received it. Right. <clears throat> I'm handing you what's been marked as states and entered into evidence as states exhibit 250, uh, sled item 8. States item 250. Take a moment to review it and let me know if you are aware of what it is. Uh, yes, sir. I recognize this as sled item 8. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to examine and review that item? I did. Uh, what did you determine it, it was or is? Um, sled item eight, uh, state's exhibit number 250, uh, was determined to be uh, one fired bullet, and that was listed as a near tire impression at marker eight. Okay. And you were able to do further analysis, which will get to the results to determine its weight? Yes, sir. Very good. 
So as you testified before, this would be the bullet minus the casing that it originally came in. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That is uh, just one fired bullet. And that's what it looks like when it doesn't have the back part on it? Yes, sir. That's just a, a bullet without um, any cartridge case attached to it. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to State's Exhibit Number 20, Sled Item 14. This is evidence already. I'm going to hand it to you and ask if you conducted an exam of this item. Yes, sir, I did. All right, what are the results? Um, I, sled item 14, which is Stakes Exhibit 20, uh, was determined to be 24 birdshot pellets listed as um, from dog food storage room. And can you repeat it for my purposes? These are pellets from what? Uh, yes, sir, 24 birdshot pellets. Um, listed as uh, from dog food storage room. When you testified before and you, you presented what a shotgun shell looks like, would, would that be what's inside a shotgun shell ultimately? Uh, yes, sir. That would be an example of birdshot pellets that uh, would be loaded into a shotgun shell. <coughs> All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to What's been entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 76, sled item number 12. Did you have an opportunity to review this item after you take a look at it? Yes, sir. All right, tell us what it is, please. Um, sled item 12 states exhibit 76 uh, was determined to be one fired bullet listed as from bedding inside doghouse. I'm going to direct your attention to states exhibit 102, sled item 11. Please take a look at this item. Let me know if you're familiar with its contents. Yes, sir. This is sled item 11, States Exhibit 102, and that was determined to be one fired bullet jacket fragment, three bullet jacket fragments, and one piece of lead. Uh, listed as defect in ground gravel marker 13. Thank you. All right, I'm going to refer to what's been identified as States Exhibit 109. Slide item. 137. Would you please review this item and let me know if you recognize it and if you performed an examination of it. Uh, yes, sir. This is a uh, sled item 137, States Exhibit 109, and it was determined to be one piece of lead listed as from hair on the item 92 dress. At this point, State would move for 109 to be admitted into 
Moving on to State's Exhibit 110, which is slide items 67 and 68. I'll direct your attention to that. It's been marked as, uh, for identification purposes, as, as State's Item 110. No objection. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as evidence as 110. If you would, please take a look at it. Let me know if you've uh, recognized it and performed an examination on it. Uh, yes, sir. State's Exhibit 110 um, represents two sled items. Sled item 67, which I examined, uh, determined to be 48 birdshot pellets listed as from left shoulder and head of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. And uh, sled item 68 um, was one piece of plastic listed as from left shoulder and head of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. When you say where it's from, that's because that's what was identified on the item when it was submitted to, your, to you for review? Yes, sir. That's um, solely based on how it was logged into our system by the submitting uh, personnel. All right. I'm going to refer your attention now to three <coughs> items just to speed along the process a little bit. States 111, 112, and 113 marked as identification purposes. Sled item 69, 66, and 104. So if you please take a look at those in your items in your in your report, I'll be right with you. Resume in one hour and 15 minutes. Thank you. You may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court? Yes, sir. Uh, beginning with items, states exhibits 11, uh, 111, 112, 113, I believe right before we broke, I presented to counsel and was going to offer it to the witness, and I believe it was uh, without objection going to be uh, offered into evidence. Is that correct? Without objection. Yeah, without objection. All right, Agent, or uh, Mr. Greer. <clears throat> Please review um, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 111 and 113, which would align with <coughs> sled items 66, 69, and 104. If you would, please let us know if you had an opportunity to inspect those items and analyze them. Uh, yes, sir, I did. Um, State's Exhibit 112 is sled item 66, and that was determined to be three fired bullet jacket fragments and seven pieces of lead listed as from Margaret Murdoch at autopsy. State's Exhibit 11. 111? Yes, sir, excuse me, I apologize. 111 is sled item 69. And that is one combination wad listed as f from left axilla of Paul Murdoch at autopsy. In state's exhibit 113 is sled item 104. And that was one birdshot pellet listed as found with Paul Murdoch's clothing. Thank you. All right, Mr. Greer, I'm going to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 90, Sled Item 31. <coughs> did you have an opportunity to inspect this item? Um, I did inspect a Sled Item 31. 
Is this the item you inspected? Um, this firearm is unloaded, safe to handle. Yes, sir, I see my identifying marks um, as slit item 31 on this firearm. Tell us what this is. And that was determined to be one Browning model Auto 5 light 12 semi-automatic shotgun, 12 gauge with serial number 03867NV211. And did you conduct further examinations on that firearm that we discussed in a little bit? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to sh show you what's been marked as state's exhibit and entered into evidence, state's exhibit 89. Item 30 on your report. <clears throat> Did you have an opportunity to inspect that firearm? Um, this firearm is also unloaded. Yes, sir, I did. And how do you know that? Um, when I'm looking at these firearms, um, we uh, scribe our evidence, if possible, um, in multiple locations. So I'm looking for those identifying features of that SLED lab number and that item number, as well as my initials on some of these items that I was able to, to mark that. So I, I see that on this firearm. of our results that we'll discuss shortly. Did you conduct additional testing on that firearm? Uh, yes, sir. Handing you what's been marked as an entered into evidence as states exhibit 91. That would be your sled item number 32. Tell me if you recognize that firearm, if you, uh, in fact, were the one that uh, received it and conducted examinations on it. Um, this firearm is also unloaded. I'm going to look again for those um, identifying marks. Uh, yes, sir, I identify this as my slit item 32. direct your attention to what's been entered into evidence as States Exhibit 91, I'm sorry, States Exhibit 88, and SLED Item 33. Are you familiar with that item? Um, this firearm is also unloaded. Yes, sir. I am familiar with this item. Is that the item that you uh, conducted tests on? Yes, sir. This is the sled item 33. Exhibit 210, which would be sled item 34. That's been entered into evidence. Collectively, as item states, item 210, 
Are you familiar with the contents of that evidence package? Yes, sir, I am. And what are they? Um, Sled item 34, States Exhibit 210, um, was determined to be one magazine and 26 unfired um, cellular and Bellow 300 blackout um, caliber cartridges. And was sled item 34, but this state's exhibit 210 included with the uh, rifle we just uh, took a look at? Uh, yes, sir. It was submitted in the same uh, package as the uh, rifle. Moving on to States Exhibit 143 through, sorry, States Exhibit 143, 144, 150, and 148. Entered into evidence already. That would be sled items 166, 167, 168, and 169. Yes, sir. And then you have been marked as those exhibits. Would you please take an op a chance to review those? Let me know if you're familiar with them and if you had an opportunity to uh, analyze them. Yes, sir, I believe I have seen these items. Okay. Tell us what they are, if you would. Um, each of these uh, four items um, are 12 gauge of uh, federal shot shells, and they each all have the uh, markings that are consistent with each other, a federal premium double lock buck, three inch magnum. And do your notes indicate where they were located? Um, I have an indication based on the packaging. Okay, what did the packaging indicate? Um, the packaging for um, State's Exhibit 150, um, from what I can tell, says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. For State's Exhibit 144 says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. Stakes Exhibit 143 says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. And Stakes Exhibit 148 um, also says from Red Bin on Workshop Bench. All right, thank you. Now I'm going to hand you what's been uh, previously entered into evidence as states exhibits 145, 146, 147, and 149. That would be sleds um, number 162, 163, 164, and 165. Uh, same as before, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, take a look at those and let me know if you are familiar with their contents. Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what they are. Um, all four of these items um, are Winchester 12 gauge shot shells, and they all appear to have the same information on the shot shell of dry lock 3 inch with the number 2.
going to hand you what's been uh, previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 213, slide item 45. Please take a look at the, uh, that piece of evidence and let me know if you are aware of what it is. Uh, yes, sir. This appears to be a, a box for um, ammunition um, in the 300 blackout caliber. And does uh, th that box indicate the maker of that 300 blackout ammunition? It does. Who's the manufacturer? Um, Cellier and Billo. S and B. Yes, sir. Evidence of State's Exhibit 260. Please take, a, if you would, please take a moment to review those items and let you let me know if you're familiar with them. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I am familiar with this evidence. And what are they? Um, these are sled items 35 through 39. Um, these were each of uh, fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases um, with the head stamp of Cellier and Bello. Thank you. Previously, a state's exhibit 261. For identification purposes only, just a reference sled item numbers 108 to 135. now admitted under state's exhibit as state's exhibit 261 um, please take a moment to review those items um, any notes or uh, information you might have on them and let me know if you're aware of what they are uh, yes container a b uh, was submitted to the laboratory um, and it um, is to contain sled items 108 through 135. I am familiar with, with these items, and this package appears to um, not have been tampered with since I sealed it last, as I see my initials and seal date there at the bottom. And what's um, inside that package? Inside this package, there are um, 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, as well as 12-gauge uh, shot shells. And did you have an opportunity to perform an analysis on these items? Yes, sir, I did. Offering you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 398 that would reference slide item 22.4, and I believe without objection, we'll offer it as evidence. That's correct. You would please uh, take a look at that item 
and uh, cross-reference with your report and let me know if you're familiar with what it is. Yes, sir. Um, this container contains um, two sled items. Um, that's item, sled item 22.4. Um, which is a swab of debris that I took, a reddish brown debris swab from the right side of the item 22 receiver. Which item is 22? Remember item this? item 22 was the camouflage um, Benelli model Super Black Eagle 3 semi-automatic shotgun. Um, and it also contains sled item 22.5, which was another swab from that same shotgun, and that was um, reddish brown debris swab from the left side of the item 22 receiver above manufacturer information. And tell us a little bit about the swabs and what you're looking for with that. Uh, yes, sir. When, when I receive uh, items of evidence, a part of my process in documenting the evidence and opening the evidence is to look to see if there's any foreign or trace material on that item. And um, when I was examining this firearm and opening it for the first time, I took note of that. And when I did that, I, I noticed two, those two areas um, that I saw reddish brown debris. Um, in order to preserve that prior to my examination, I uh, swabbed those items um, so that way they could be uh, collected and um, maintained. <coughs> Mr. Graham, I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 399, which references sled item 22.7. Uh, State would offer that into evidence after you identify it, and I believe without objection. Uh, yes, sir, I do recognize this, and this package is still sealed with my initials and seal date. Um, item 22.7. Um, was the unfired 12-gauge shot shell that was submitted with the item uh, 22 camouflage Benelli uh, Super Black Eagle 3 shotgun. Um, during my testing, I used that submitted ammunition that came with the firearm um, to test fire the, the weapon with, and that is represented here as um, sled item 22.7, um, States Exhibit 399. Okay. So, Please um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about the uh, firearms identification process and the number of ways that you use to identify uh, whether a firearm shot a particular projectile. Sure. Um, as we were discussing earlier, when I receive evidence into the laboratory and I begin my examination, um, there's a lot of documentation that has to happen. Um, first, as we're opening the evidence, we're going to, um, one, make sure um, to preserve any of that trace or foreign material. Um, we take use photography to document the evidence as we're opening it and to photograph the actual item itself and that trace material or foreign material. Um, we also use a lot of uh, departmental worksheets where I take notes on the firearm, um, the magazine, uh, the fired components such as the cartridge case or the bullet, and also um, any other thing that we need to document um, throughout the process or unfired cartridges. Um, we take note of all of that, writing down all of these characteristics that we're seeing on the evidence. Um, in order to do our examination though, uh, we have to look at these um, fired ammunition components, these cartridge cases and these um, fired bullets, and look at their, uh, their class characteristics. So we're gonna count um, on a bullet. We're gonna look at its rifling, trying to determine um, its caliber through weight and measuring it and um, counting those number of lands and grooves that comprise that rifling like we spoke earlier. That's what gives that bullet that twist. Um, we document that. Um, we may also look at those cartridge cases and look at those things that have the same class characteristic. That could be the caliber of that cartridge case, the shape of that firing pin, and any overall features. Um, items that share the same class characteristics will compare together. Um, and it's kind of like climbing a ladder at this point. Those items that share the same class characteristics, we climb to the next uh, step on that ladder 
and we compare those items. Um, we're going to look at those fired bullets with each other, those fired cartridge cases with each other, and we're going to look at all of that under um, high uh, magnification. We use a comparison microscope in our laboratory to look at these items. And basically, if you think back to a, a biology lab that you may have had in school or some kind of science lab, when you look through a microscope, that's what we're doing. But we're using this comparison microscope to look at two things at one time. And we've used, uh, it uses an ocular bridge so we can look through like a set of binoculars to look at these things. Um, we can change the angles that we're looking at, all these tiny little scratches and striations and impressions on the evidence. Um, that you can't really see with the naked eye. We're going to look at it under that magnification and compare all of that to each other um, to help us reach our final goal, which is a conclusion. Um, if we have firearms that are submitted, um, we'll also have that documented. Those firearms that have the same class characteristics, for instance, if we have a gun that's the same caliber as our fire bullet and it shares the same rifling specifications, then that means we can compare that bullet um, with test fires from the firearm. So I'll make sure the firearm is safe to fire, and we'll shoot that firearm within our laboratory. Um, we have several different ways to do that with a water recovery tank um, and a, a tunnel that we're able to shoot and recover those test specimens that I physically shot from the firearm. Um, I'll compare those test specimens with each other to look at how those marks that I was um, looking for under the microscope that we were talking about to see how they're reproducing on those test fires in um, the, whether that be a bullet or cartridge case compare that under the microscope and then compare that where necessary um, to the submitted evidence. Um, after looking at all that, I would reach a conclusion about whether this was fired by this item or not, um, or, or whatever that conclusion may be. I arrive at that and I write that conclusion down. Um, at that point in time, another qualified examiner within our firearms department will review the evidence themselves. They'll look at all the submitted evidence and compare that with each other and with those test specimens that I fired and arrive at their own conclusion. Um, if they're in agreement, then they'll sign off on my conclusions um, and a report can be drafted. And that's how we get the information out to, to our customers through our report. Um, at SLED, we have the 100% micro verification process where everything that we're issuing a conclusion on um, is, is reviewed by another examiner. So that case file, all that documentation that I generate um, goes to uh, that examiner or reviewer. It goes, undergoes a technical review and an administrative review before a report can be released. Um, and in a nutshell, that's, that's how we work each case. Um, there, there are different parts. There's different items of evidence that we get in each case. But that's a quick overview of how each case has worked. And, and those, uh, that process was applied to this case. Thank you. Mr. Greer. Speaking of the, the peer review process that goes on in the lab, is that conducted uh, blindly, meaning the person reviewing your, your report doesn't <coughs> know what your findings are? That's correct. Okay. Could you explain? So the, the su subsequent reviewer doesn't know what you decided in your uh, first prime, prime opinion. Is that right? Right. I'll look at the evidence myself, um, arrive at a conclusion, and um, the second examiner will look at it um, and come to their conclusion on their own. Um, if Once they have arrived at their own conclusion, looking at the evidence with their own eyes on the microscope, they'll read my results to see if they're in agreement with m what I have determined or not. And that, I think you just testified, but was that done in this case? Yes, sir, it was. Tell, uh, before we move on, please tell me what it means for a, a um, cartridge casing to be cycled through a weapon. What does that mean? Sure. Um, if you think back when we were looking at the cartridge um, earlier, an unfired cartridge, um, when, we're gonna, when we look at these items under magnification on the microscope, there are several different areas that we're going to be concerned with um, in looking at for those microscopic scratches and impressions, um, those little striations. One of those would be um, a firing pin, and that's what uh, comes through the breech face of the gun to detonate the primer. Um, also, the breech uh, face marks on that primer from the gun. Um, ejector marks, that's what kicks that cartridge out of the gun or the cartridge case. Extractor marks, that's what pulls it out of the chamber of the firearm so that it can be pick, kicked out. And also um, chamber marks, and that's on the body of, of the cartridge case, that cylindrical portion. Um, so when we're looking at evidence, our ultimate goal is to say something was fired by this gun or they were fired by the same gun. 
Um, and we do that and we can rely on that firing, those firing pin part marks and those breach face marks because that's what struck the primer and caused it to detonate and fire that cartridge. Um, there's other things that we can look at um, just to single out like extractor marks and ejector marks um, and chamber marks of such that we can look at to say that a cartridge um, has traveled through a gun. For example, if you were to load a magazine, insert it into um, a semi-automatic firearm, pull the slide back, load that cartridge into the chamber, and then you decide you're not going to shoot or you need to remove that cartridge for any reason, you would pull back on that slide of the handgun and the cartridge would be extracted out of the chamber and ejected. Through that process, um, there can be marks left on um, the cartridge. Um, that also would happen when you're firing it, but that's not what detonated that primer and set that off. Those ejector marks, those extractor marks, um, and that just means that that cartridge, we can say, has traveled through that firearm at one point in time. Um, that's not to say it was fired by, but it's cycling marks that we're seeing as it's cycled through that gun. So, so <clears throat> is it accurate to say then that the cycling marks are separate and distinct from the actual firing pin marks that when you're reviewing these under a microscope? Uh, yes, sir. As far as um, what we're looking at geographically on the cartridge case, um, those would be in a different location when we're looking for those ejector marks or extractor marks or chamber marks. Um, that's not something that we <coughs> typically would be seeing on um, the primer area that detonated that cartridge. Thank you. If I could, uh, beginning with your results, um, if, if we could begin with your <clears throat> examination of all the shotgun shells, so the actual shells that were retrieved as part of uh, your analysis, beginning with items, sled items 9 and 10, which would be states item 33 and 34, could you tell me where these items were retrieved? Remind us where these items were retrieved from, first of all. Um, sled items 9 and 10, that states exhibit 33 and 34. Um, items, item 9 was from marker 9, and item 10 was from marker 10, which is my understanding that it was um, at the, the feed or storage room. And I'm going to put these on the Elmo, but if you would tell us what your analysis of these Yes, sir. Um, objection to these opinions um, based on yes, prior ruling. Please proceed, Mr. Um, yes, sir. Um, when I compared and examined those two shot shells um, with each other, I determined that um, those two shot shells had been fired by the same firearm. Shells? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Um, Slide item, item nine. nine. Yes, sir. Which uh, item nine is which item? Um, item nine is the red and color shot shell, which is States Exhibit 34. Okay. That was a federal premium double alt buck three inch magnum shot shell. And sled item 10 was is the black and color shot shell, States Exhibit 33. And that is a fire 12 gauge Winchester dry lock uh, number two shot shell. All right, Mr. Greer, moving on to uh, referencing item 22 collectively. Yes, sir. States exhibit 399, 22.7 on your report. Yes, sir. This would be States Exhibit 399. Um, did you have an opportunity? Or could you tell us what that is? Uh, yes, sir. That was um, the unfired 12 gauge shot shell that was submitted <coughs> originally with the item 22 shotgun, which is the camouflage color uh, Benelli shotgun. 
you go ahead and open that uh, package for us, please? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Do you have scissors or just? again where that item was retrieved from um, this item was originally submitted with the item 22 camouflage Benelli shotgun um, that was submitted to uh, the laboratory meaning it was actually loaded into the shotgun um, when I received it it was not loaded in the shotgun um, but this was an unfired shot shell um, as it was submitted this is the shot shell that I test fired in that shotgun Manufacturer of this item is? Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell, and on the, um, the shot shell itself, it also says federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum. I'm going to direct your attention back to state's item 34. Are those two items consistent with each other? Uh, yes, sir. Um, it does appear that they are consistent um, in construction and um, their head stamp information. If you would, since uh, let's work through the number of firearms that were identified by you. Were, did you have an opportunity to uh, test those firearms with the projectiles retrieved? Uh, yes, sir, I did. What were your results for item 30, the Mossberg pump action shotgun? Um, in regards to uh, the two shot shells? Correct. Um, uh, my, my results after examining that, it was determined that the item 30 shotgun um, did not fire the items 9 and 10 shot shells. And could you move on to item, uh, your item 31, state's item, one moment, I'm sorry. And the item you just referenced was state's item 89, the Mossberg shotgun. State's item, state's exhibit 90, sled item 31. Could you please tell us about that item. Yes, sir. Based on my examination, um, it was, I was able to determine that item 31 was not fired by, excuse me, that item 31 did not fire items 9 and 10. All right, concerning state's exhibit 91, your uh, sled item 32, that would be a Benelli Super Black Eagle 2, black in color. Could you tell us your results of that? Yes, sir. Uh, based on my examination, it was determined that item 32 did not fire items 9 and 10. Item 32 uh, was, however, recovered with a, a number of rounds in it. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. And what were those rounds? Um, those, item 32, uh, the Benelli model Super Black Eagle II shotgun, um, was submitted with two unfired 12-gauge um, shot shells, Federal and Winchester.
All right, did you have an opportunity to compare the shot shells with item 22, the camouflage color Benelli Super Black Eagle 3? Yes, sir, I did. All right, and if you would please uh, tell us your findings concerning item 22. Sure. When I compared uh, sled items 9 and 10 with those test shot shells that I fired through the item 22 camouflage shotgun, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. Um, I was unable to determine whether or not items 9 and 10 were fired by item 22 or if they had been fired by another firearm with similar characteristics. And were you able to eliminate item, <coughs> item number um, 33 from this, this round of testing concerning the shotgun shells? That's correct. The shotgun shells were not fired by the item 33 rifle. Moving on to your results, uh, sorry, moving on to your testing, or did you conduct additional testing of 300 blackout rounds? Yes, sir, I did. And of the cases of the ammunition both fired, ex expense, so shell casings, or unfired ammunition, were the ones we examined today that were retrieved from the scene what, what make and manufacture were they of? The cartridge cases were head stamped with the SMB um, logo and 300 blackout caliber. Did you have an opportunity to test fire and examine uh, sled item 33, states item, states exhibit 88? The PS, uh, the uh, 300 blackout rifle, black in color? Yes, sir, I did. All right, could you please tell us your results from that examination for that weapon? Um, in regards to test firing the weapon? Correct. Yes, sir. Um, when I examined the item 33, um, I test fired it using the item 34 magazine. That was the magazine that was packaged alongside the rifle. Um, during that test firing, the first available cartridge in the magazine, as I inserted the magazine into the firearm, it was fed and chambered into the rifle um, correctly and as I expected. Um, the cartridge was successfully test fired and then it extracted and ejected from the rifle again as I expected it to. However, as the firearm cycled, uh, meaning when that bolt was coming back forward to load the next available cartridge in the magazine, um, it failed to feed that cartridge into the chamber and I had to manually cycle it to, to load the next cartridge into the chamber. Um, that issue did not prevent me from test firing uh, the firearm and no further analysis uh, to determine that cause was uh, conducted. Referencing your results, uh, slide item 128 in your exam, were you able to identify any ca cartridge casings that would have been fired by item 33 rifle? Your item 33 states exhibit 90, um, states exhibit uh, 88. Uh, yes, sir, I was. And just to be clear, we're talking about this 300 blackout rifle. Is that correct? We're talking about your item 33? Yes, sir, that is uh, sled item 33 that I examined and test fired. What were you able to identify with the uh, rounds recovered, the 300 blackout rounds recovered? Please list their, their item numbers as well. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so I compared all the 300 blackout um, cartridges that I received, and based on my examinations and comparisons, I was able to determine that uh, sled item 38, 109, 110, 121, 126, and 127 were fired by the item 33 rifle. And those would be various items that were recovered that we've been through and identified in the state's exhibits. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. So some of them, you, you would say, were fired by item 33. That is correct. I know you mentioned before with item 33, or sorry, uh, state's exhibit 89. I'm sorry, <clears throat> state's exhibit um, 88. I know you'd mentioned before that it wasn't working properly. Does that inhibit your ability to test it in any way? Uh, no, sir. I was able to test fire that firearm and uh, recover those test specimens that I needed in order to make those comparisons. Do malfunctions occur in firearms from time to time? Uh, yes, sir. They can occur. But nevertheless, you were able to uh, simulate the fire. You were able to fire the weapon eventually. 
Yes, sir. I was able to, to test fire the weapon and recover those uh, test specimens that I need. All right. I'm going to reference sled items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120. Do you understand what, which items I'm referencing? Yes, sir. I do. And how did you compare those, or how did the analysis go when compared with item uh, 33, states item 88? Uh, yes, sir. Um, when I compared those, those items, that was items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, and 122 through 124, and 128 with each other. And when I compared those with those test specimens that um, I fired through item 33, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. Um, again, that means I was unable to determine if they had been fired by item 33 or they had been fired by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. Uh, still on item 33, states, item, states exhibit 88, the recovered 300 blackout rifle. Were you able to um, compare the ejection and extraction marks of various 300 blackout rounds recovered and casings recovered? Yes, sir. And what was your what was your findings concerning some of those items? And please list the items, and we will go back and identify states' exhibits in a minute. Yes, sir. Um, in looking at the mechanism marks on items 111, 114 through 115, 118 through 119, 123, and 128, I was able to determine that those items um, had all been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the item three rifle excuse me, the item 33 rifle at some previous time. All right. Mr. Greer, I'm going to ask you, Your Honor. I'm going to renew my objection to the next uh, opinion that he's about to offer based on our prior rulings, just for the record. Yes, sir. Based on prior arguments and understanding the court's rule. Yes, sir. Mr. Greer, I'm going to Real quick reference on your chart, on your list, items marked uh, sled items 2 through 7, 35, 36, and 37, and sled item 39. And that would be states exhibits 63 through 68. Just please verify that I've handed you states exhibits 63 through 68 and, and identify if they correlate to items 2 through 7 on your chart. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, these states exhibit 63 through 68 are sled items 2 through 7. What's been marked as take the court's indulgence? States exhibit 260. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's States Exhibit 250, which correlates to slide items 35 through 39. Please verify that for me. Yes, sir. This is States Exhibit 260, um, which is a container that is to contain sled items 35 through 39. Okay. <clears throat> slide items 2 through 7. States Exhibit 60. Three through 68. After a review of the crime scene, um, where were those where were those located? Um, after reviewing the crime scene diagram, it's my understanding that those uh, cartridge cases um, were at marker numbers that were uh, near or around um, the body of Margaret Murdoch. And those would be 300 blackout rounds, is that right? That's correct. That, they're 300 blackout caliber. Or they were spent casings. 
Yes, sir. Those are uh, fire cartridge cases. And states uh, exhibit 260 items 35 to 39. What are those again? Um, those were um, all fire 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases, um, head stamp with the SMB logo with the and 300 blackout caliber. And where were those items recovered? Um, listed on our submission documents. Um, those were from the ground at side entrance door. Have you physically been there to the Moselle property? Uh, yes, sir, I have. Are you familiar with this, the ground at the side entrance door? Yes, sir, I believe so. Is that the side entrance that leads into the pool table and the gun room? Uh, based on my understanding of, of the scene, yes, sir, um, I believe that is where those were collected from near that door that goes into that room. We have, we have 300 blackout round casings from, collected from around Maggie's body, and we have 300 casings collected from the house. Is that correct? That's correct. And do we have, no, do you have any notes? Did you take any contemporaneous notes on the condition of items, your items 35 to 39, those collected at the side of the house? Um, yes, sir, I do believe so. I'm, I'm gonna reference my, my case file here to confirm. Would referencing your file help you refresh your memory on that matter? Yes, sir, it would. Um, during my examination, when I looked at items 35 through 39, which were those were recovered um, near that door area, um, I did note that um, they were tarnished and weathered um, in my case file. Mr. Greer, tell us what you found concerning those items. Um, based on my examination, um, it was determined that um, items 2 through 7, um, 35 through 37, and 39 um, had matching mechanism marks, and it was concluded that those items had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. So if I understand it correctly, the items collected right by Maggie had been extracted, to, loaded into, extracted to, and ejected by the same firearm that were identified that items were picked up by the side of the house. Yes, sir, that is correct. Additional items were collected as well, and did you have an opportunity to analyze those? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And identify the slide item numbers, and then we'll identify the, the uh, state's exhibit numbers. Um, those were slid items number 108, 113, 116, 117, and 122. Handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 261, it's, which includes uh, various uh, items. And what are they again? Uh, yes, sir. This is a container that contains uh, multiple 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases and um, fired 12 gauge shot shells. And in that, <clears throat> in that collective bin, include 300 blackout rounds uh, of the items you just listed. Yes, sir, that's correct. All right, tell us what your findings were for those items. Um, where, where were these collected? Um, based on the submission documentation, um, those were collected um, from areas such as from to the left of a shooting chair near field, um, from a right corner near field, um, from in front of a shooter's chair under a table. Um, Would you like me to uh, identify each location? For those items, have you had an opportunity to review some uh, body-worn camera footage and evidence and, and kind of identify what that actually meant? Oh, yes, sir. What, what, and generally, when it says left leg and right leg and near the front or back, what is it talking about? Um, it, it appears that there's some type of uh, shooting area um, that those were collected from. Okay. What were your findings concerning those items? Um, it was determined that those items um, and to include items 108, 113, 116, 117, and 122, also had those same matching mechanism marks to conclude that they had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm as those at the crime scene around Margaret Murdoch's body and those uh, several recovered from the home. 
So the items collected around Maggie, Margaret Murdaugh's body matched the items collected outside the house, which matched items that were collected in the field at the shooting range. Uh, yes, sir. I was able to identify that the cartridge cases uh, recovered items two through seven near the, uh, the body um, did have matching mechanism marks with several of the items from the area around the home and those in the shooting field and several of those in the shooting field to conclude that some of those had been, or excuse me, that those had been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. I'm going to reference slide item 8. That would be state's item 250, state's exhibit 250. I'm going to put it on the screen. What is that item again? Remind us, please. Um, sled item eight was one fired bullet um, determined to be 300 blackout caliber listed as near tire impression at marker eight. Recovered from the scene? Uh, yes, sir, at marker eight. Is that a fired projectile? Yes, sir, that is a fired bullet. Is that, how much does that bullet weigh? Um, according to um, my notes when I weighed that projectile, um, it weighed approximately 147.4 grains. Handing you what's marked as Exhibit 213. Remind us again what that is. Stakes Exhibit 213 appears to be an ammunition box um, marked cellular and bellow in 300 blackout caliber. What are the grains indicated on that box? On the side of this box, it has information about the um, the projectile, and it says 147 grains on the side. Is item is, is state's exhibit up on the Alamo? Is that consistent with a 147 grain projectile? Uh, yes, sir. Um, that bullet appears to be intact, um, and based on um, my examination and looking at these fired bullets as a part of a, an examination, I would say that would be consistent with uh, having being 147 grains. Did you inspect sled item 12? Yes, sir, I did. Tell us your results of that. Sled item 12 was one fired bullet, uh, determined to also be 300, most consistent with being 300 blackout caliber, um, and it was listed as from bedding inside doghouse. And did you have an opportunity to weigh that projectile? Yes, sir, I did. And what was the result of that? Um, when I weighed that projectile, it was approximately 146.8 grains. Is that consistent with a 147 grain unfired ammunition? Yes, sir. I would say that would be consistent with 147 grains. I'm going to show you <clears throat> what's been marked as state and entered into evidence as state's exhibit 143, 144, 148, and 150. Could you please remove those collectively and let me know if you are familiar with the make and manufacture of those items. Uh, 
Um, State's Exhibit 143 is a 12-gauge um, federal shot shell. It says federal premium double lock buck, three inch magnum on the shell, on the side of the shell. States Exhibit 144 is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell. Um, on the side of it, it says federal premium double lock buck, three inch magnum. States Exhibit 148 um, is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell. On the side of it, it says federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum. And States Exhibit 150 is also a 12 gauge federal shot shell um, with the same information of federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum. Are all of those four exhibits that you just reviewed of the same manufacturer and same make and model? Yes, sir. They appear to um, have the same information and uh, also in their case, excuse me, in their construction as well. So if I use one for demonstrative purposes, all the rest are the same? Uh, yes, sir. They appear to be all consistent. Showing you what you just identified. This would be States 143. Is this the item you just looked at, Mr. Greer? Yes, sir. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 34. Remind me again which item that is. Sled item 9. State's Exhibit 34 was sled item 9. That's correct. And what's the make and model of that? Um, sled item 9, State's Exhibit 34 was a fired 12 gauge shot shell. Um, with the federal premium double lock buck three inch magnum, red in color. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 399. This would be, yeah, where's, where's item nine from? Um, item nine is listed as from marker nine. And again, based on my understanding of the crime scene uh, document, that was um, near or around the, the speed room. And marked as State's Exhibit 399. Sled item 22.7, where is that item from? Um, sled item 22.7, um, States Exhibit 399, was the unfired 12 gauge shot shell that was originally submitted as item 22 with the camouflage Benelli shotgun. States item 4, and you've already reviewed this. Exhibit four for the state, 22 for you. Is that the same shotgun that you're referring to? <clears throat> yes, sir, this is my item 22 shotgun. Camouflage Benelli Super Black Eagle three. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And all those items are of the same model and manufacturer, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, they all appear to have the same uh, head stamp information and information on the side of the shell and their case construction all appears to be consistent. Reference your item 10 now. Well, first, let me collectively hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibits 144, sorry, State's Exhibits 145, 146, 147, and 149 collectively. Please take them out individually, review them. Let me know if you recall what they are. Make and, model, make and manufacture is what I'm interested in. States Exhibit 145, um, it's head stamp Winchester 12 gauge with dry lock 3 inch and a 2 on the shell.
States Exhibit 146 is head stamp Winchester 12 gauge. On the shell it says dry lock, three inch number two. States Exhibit 147 is head stamp Winchester 12 gauge. On the shell, dry lock, three inch, number two. And States Exhibit 149, head stamp Winchester 12 gauge, on the shell, dry lock, three inch, number two. Do you know to indicate where those items were recovered? Um, based on the packaging. What is the packaging? Where does the patchy packaging indicate those items were recovered? Um, the packaging for States Exhibit 145 um, says from a state box on bookshelf and gun room. States Exhibit 146 says from Kent box on bookshelf and gun room. States Exhibit 147 says um, from nightstand in Paul's room. And States Exhibit 149 says, from a state box on bookshelf and gun room. I'm going to hand you what's been marked and identified as States Exhibit 33, slide out of 10. Where was that located? Um, sled item 10, um, again, was a fired 12 gauge shot shell. Um, head stamp Winchester 12 gauge on the side, dry lock, three inch number two. And that was located at marker 10, um, which again, based on my understanding, was uh, near that feed room. Identify, please, the make and manufacturer of that item. Um, yes, sir. It was uh, head stamp Winchester uh, 12 gauge. And on the shell, it says dry lock, three inch two. Is that consistent with the make and manufacturer of all the other items you just reviewed? Yes, sir, it is. Are those all the items you just reviewed, Mr. Brew? Yes, sir. All right, no further questions from the state. We'll take a few minutes break, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Do, do not discuss the case. Sir, cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Just want to see if we can agree on one thing, and that is you're not here to tell this jury that any of the weapons in this room were used, in your opinion, to murder Maggie or Paul, correct? Uh, based on my examination of uh, the evidence, um, I had, was able to identify that there were um, matching mechanism marks in items around, um, as mentioned, the body of Maggie Murdoch and um, other areas of the property. And in regards to the two shot shells in comparison with those uh, shotguns, um, items nine and 10 were inconclusive with the item 22 shotgun. So that means you, you cannot and you did not and you are not offering an opinion that item 22 shotgun was used to murder Paul Murdoch, correct? My result was inconclusive. Um, and what that ultimately means is I'm not able to determine that. It's, it's a possibility that it could have been fired by that shotgun and it also could have been another firearm with similar characteristics. Meaning it's just equally possible it wasn't that gun. That's possible. And this 300 blackout. We know a 300 blackout was used to murder Maggie Murdoch, correct? Um, based on um, the evidence that I received, I did have um, several um, projectiles that were 300 blackout caliber um, that were most consistent with that, as well as several cartridge cases that were head stamped that caliber. 
And you're not here to tell this jury, in your opinion, that this 300 blackouts laying on the floor here was used to murder Maggie Murdoch, correct? Um, the results of the comparisons of those cartridge cases, um, items two through seven, um, with test fires from that uh, item 33 rifle were also inconclusive, uh, meaning it's, um, I was unable to determine if those cartridge cases were fired by item 33 or they've been fired by another firearm. Well, how many shot, how many cartridges were found at the murder scene of 300 blackouts. Do you remember? Um, based on my understanding of the crime scene, um, I believe I was only submitted items two through seven. Um, so that would be six uh, fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. Um, and again, I, I was not at the scene um, to recover those, that's just what was submitted to, to me and based on my understanding of, of the, the evidence. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on the 300 blackout for a moment and I'm going to show you what we marked as uh, Defendant's Exhibit 69. Excuse me? Just what I previously Yeah. And, um, and, and you have your file there, but take a look at Defendant 69 and see, tell us if you recognize that document as coming from your firearms file report, excuse me, extended report. Uh, yes, sir. This um, state's exhibit. Defendant's exhibit. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Defendant's exhibit 69 um, does appear to be a copy of um, two pages from my case file. Thank you. Your Honor, we would move defendant's exhibit 69 in the evidence. I believe without objection. Without objection. So admit it. Yeah. Uh, this is page number 67 and 68. We're going to pull it up on the screen. And, and while we're doing that, um, Agent Greer, is this your worksheet for the 300 blackout that's here in the courtroom in sled item 33, which bears state's exhibit number 88? Uh, yes, sir. That would be a, a, a copy of my worksheet for sled item 33. Okay. And this is the... This is the item that you're not prepared to tell the jury here that, in your opinion, was not used to murder Maggie Murdoch. Um, based on my examination of the cartridge cases, or several of those cartridge cases that were recovered from all the locations, um, the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. I'm unable to determine if they were fired by that firearm or by another firearm or firearms with those similar characteristics. But you did test fire this uh, item 33, correct? Yes, sir, I did. And on, on the second page of exhibit 69, uh, Doug, if you'll pull up the description of what happened, and if you'll tell the jury what problems you encountered when you test fired item 33, which is state's exhibit 88. Yes, sir. Um, during the test firing, um, I loaded the magazine um, with cartridges. Um, that was sled item 34. And I inserted that into the magazine well of the sled item 33, the rifle. Um, I chambered the first available cartridge into the firearm and fired it. Um, that went as expected. Um, the cartridge was fired. It extracted and ejected from that firearm properly. Um, however, as that bolt was going back forward, um, I would have expected it to pick up the next available cartridge from the magazine. However, it didn't. And I had to manually cycle that bolt again to load the next available cartridge from the magazine. 
Um, that issue did not prevent me from test firing it, and I was able to um, collect those test specimens that I needed, um, and no further analysis to determine the cause of that was conducted. So when you say you had to manually, it says as a firearm cycle, the next available cartridge in the magazine failed to feed in the chamber. So then you had to manually do it. How, how do you manually do it? Uh, yes, sir. On the, um, the top of the firearm, there's a charging handle. Um, I had to pull back on that charging handle, which in turn pulls that bolt backwards. And when I did that and released it, it was able to then go forward on its own and pick up the next cartridge from that magazine that was inserted into the firearm. Okay. And you had to do, do that every time you fired um, Exhibit 88, is that correct? Yes, sir, I believe so. During my test firing, um, I did have that phenomenon occur. So is it fair to say Exhibit 88, item 33, was malfunctioning when you tested it? Um, it did not uh, work as I expected it to. Um, I would have expected it to, to fire um, and load that next cartridge as it should. Um, however, when we're test firing these firearms, um, we're holding them in different weights because we're test firing them in a bullet a recovery tank, which at the time was a, a vertical tank filled with water. So I had to hold it in kind of a, a strange position. Um, but it, through all my test firing, I did have this situation occur. Um, but again, no other testing to determine why that um, was happening um, was conducted. And I was able to test fire that gun and collect those test specimens. And and is it fair to say you were not able to rapid fire, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, and shoot uh, bullets in immediate succession? Um, during my testing, I had to, to manually load that next cartridge in. So it just took the amount of time that it would take me to, to do that step, if you will. Instead of the firearm performing that function for me, I had to do it. Um, and, and, and that's what I did in this case. Okay. And then, um, all right. Were, were you able to get the um, projectile out of the water tank and compare it to the two projectiles found at the murder scene, I believe? I don't know if it's item eight or. As part of your analysis, did you compare ejectiles from item 33 to the projectiles found at the scene? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. I did collect those test fired bullets from our water tank, and I did compare that um, where appropriate with the fired um, projectiles that were submitted. And did you reach any conclusions based upon that projectile comparison? Um, yes, sir, I did. And what were those conclusions? Um, based on the observable physical characteristics of items 8 and 12, um, those are sled items 8 and 12, I determined those to be most consistent with 300 blackout caliber. Um, item 8 um, may be suitable for identification with other evidence, and item 12 sustained damage, um, and it was unsuitable for identification with other evidence. Um, that means that due to the damage that it had sustained, um, there were no identifying identifying features that I saw under the microscope that I would use for identification purposes. Um, I also received several other um, projectiles and fragments that I compared to the item 33 rifle. Um, due to damage in their size, the caliber of calibers items 11, 66, and 137 could not be determined. They were just too small for me to um, make any determination about their, their caliber. Um, Due to damage and the limited marks of value that I saw on item 11, specifically the fired bullet jacket fragment and the item 66 fired bullet jacket fragments, I was concluded that those may or may not be suitable for identification and used and compared those later on to the rifle. Um, based on um, the no marks of value that were displayed on the item 11 bullet jacket fragments, item 11 piece of lead and item 66 pieces of lead, um, though I determined those were unsuitable. So again, due to uh, there being no marks of value for me to compare, I was unable to, uh, to compare those with those test bullets. Um, item 137 bore some type of strided marking. However, I was unable to determine the origin of those marks and, and use those for uh, an identification purpose. 
and um, it was determined that it was also unsuitable. Um, lastly, the uh, three items that I did compare with those test specimens that fired from those rifle, which were item eight, the item 11 fired bullet jacket fragment, and the item 66 fired bullet jacket fragments, the results of those comparisons were also inconclusive um, with each other and with those test specimens, and that was due to damage and just insufficient markings for us to base our opinion on. Um, it could not be determined where, whether those items were fired by item 33 or by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. So exhibit 250 is the projectile that was found by marker 8, I believe. Just confirm that one with Lucy. Yes, sir, that is correct. Um, States Exhibit 250 was sled item 8 um, near tire impression at marker 8. That's correct. And I, I believe you just, as you're reading from your report, told the jury that, that you couldn't make any conclusions about the projectile seized at the scene from the projectiles fired in a water tank from this 300 blackout laying on the floor here. Is that right? That's correct. The results of those comparisons were inconclusive. So I'm unable to determine if item eight was fired by the rifle or by another firearm with similar rifling characteristics. Well, aren't, aren't the rifling marks on a projectile as it goes through the barrel more reliable when making firearm identifications than, than most any other tool marks that you rely upon? I wouldn't say they're more reliable. We do uh, rely on the rifling in that barrel to, to mark those projectiles, and that's what gives those markings on the, or puts those markings on those bullets. So we're able to look at them and do a, a firearms identification examination on them. Um, d tools, firearms, all mark evidence. Um, again, I was unable to do that in this case, and our, my results were inconclusive. I mean, that's due to the damage that these may have sustained and to just insufficient markings that, uh, that were on the bullet when I looked at it. There was not enough of those markings on there for me to determine if they were fired by item 33. But the item eight, exhibit 250 there, um, do you recall whether there was human organic matter on that projectile when it was recovered? Um, let me refer to my notes. Um, I don't have um, documented in my notes that there was any farm material or trace on it as uh, I received it. But uh, we know that I, that projectile was recovered at the murder scene at marker eight. Is that right? Near the top. Yes, sir. Near the tire impression at marker eight. That's correct. And you made comparisons of projectile, excuse me, of, of shell cartridges, the back end of, of, the, of the full bullet that were, that were collected at the shooting house on the property at Moselle. Um, did you not? I don't have the numbers, but we went through them a moment ago. You did. Let me ask you to take a look at the projectiles that were found. I believe they're items, well, nope. They are items 108 through 125. I'm not sure what their state exhibit numbers are, but, but if you look at 108 through 125 in your report, those are uh, spent 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. Uh, sled items 108 through 125 uh, was determined all to be fired 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. And in your report it references left of shooting chair near field, right front corner, um, et cetera. Maybe you don't know, but um, or are you aware those were collected at a gun house at a firing range on the property? 
Um, yes, yes, sir. And I'm going back up. I misspoke earlier. It's 108 through 124 are the 300 blackout caliber cartridge cases. But based on my understanding of everything, yeah, there was some type of shooting um, field or stand that um, I believe those were collected from, and that kind of seems to coincide with the item descriptions, which is what I'm familiar with. Okay, and, and were you aware that when you're sitting in the shooting house and you're you know, target practicing that there was a earthen burn that the shots were fired into? No, sir, I've never seen this area. Okay. Would it have been helpful to your analysis if the investigators had dug out um, items from the earthen burn of the projectiles, such as what's sitting in front of you as States Exhibit 250? We're able to look at bullets um, that are submitted. Um, we don't have any type of restraint. Um, it may have been helpful. Um, bullets, as we've seen here, um, come to us in all shapes and <coughs> sizes due to their damage that may have, they may have sustained. Um, so I'm, able, I'm unable to really answer that question without seeing the evidence and determining if it would be helpful. Okay. I want to ask you um, a little more about the conclusions that you've reached as uh, documented in your report. And I'm particularly uh, focused on item 128. And I'm still talking about the uh, Buster 300 blackout that's laying on the floor here in the courtroom. And just, just so we're clear, there were items, the cartridges that we talked about, the back end of the bullet, that you were able to conclude that they were fired they were fired by this gun, right? Yes, sir. I was able to determine in looking at the totality of the marks on those cartridge cases that there were items submitted to me um, have been fired by that firearm. And, and your conclusion that, that they've been fired by this gun, um, the, and we're talking about the cartridges, one is cartridge 38, which is up by the residence, correct? Yes, sir. Sled item 38, that's my understanding. Um, and it was submitted as being recovered from um, near a door. Well, and that's the door that you testified that you saw when you went on the property. Yes, sir. I believe so. That's my understanding. Okay. And, and so, um, it's been a long week, two weeks, but there was a sled agent early in the case who had a body cams going around picking up sheriff's spent shell cartridges adjacent to that door, and you believe this is one of those, correct? Um, that's my understanding that those items came from the area outside that gun room door. And you concluded that, that, that item 38, along with some other items found at the shooting house, which would be, um, well, He's 109 and 110, you concluded. And where, where are 109 and 110 found? Yeah, that's the shooting range, correct? Uh, yes, sir. As submitted to the lab, collected item 109 was collected from right front corner near field, and item 110 was in front of shooter's chair under table, table near field. Okay. And so, one spent cartridge found next to the door up at the house, main residence at Moselle, and then you've got five uh, found at the shooting range that you say, in your opinion, were fired by this gun. Yes, sir, that is my opinion. But then you've also, also matched other cartridges According to your report, items 111, 114, 115, 18, 19, 123, and it says 128 um, in your report that you say were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from this rifle. That's correct. But you don't say they were fired from this rifle. That's correct. 
but they were spent shell casings found at the shooting range, correct? Yes, sir, and, and those were fired cartridge cases in it, and it's just plain term. They had been fired. Um, when I'm looking at the totality of all these markings, again, we go back to the, those five areas that we're really gonna look at. Um, the marks that I saw that were in agreement that I made that uh, conclusion and based my opinion on um, were those ejector uh, lug and extractor marks, and that's um, not what detonated that primer. So that's the difference there. So we know those marks can occur when that cartridge or fire cartridge case is cycling through there, but that's not what um, detonated that cartridge, and, and that's the difference in, in that result. Yes, sir. Well, let's look at it from the other side of the coin. So you're saying that the breach marks on the primer, where the firing pin hit the primer, did not match up um, items. Rifle 33, the, the breech marks on the firing pin didn't match up on these uh, spent cartridges. 111, 114, 15, 118, 119, 123, 128. Um, no, sir. Um, when I, I did compare all of these cartridge cases to each other and with those test cartridge cases fired from it, um, those items, 111, 114, 115, 118, 119, 123, and 128, um, due to insufficient corresponding markings on those, on that primer and in those breech face marks, I was unable to determine if they were all fired by item 33 or by another firearm or firearms with similar characteristics. I did examine those and the results of those comparisons were inconclusive. So you're saying it, you, you didn't, you're, you're not telling the jury they don't match, it's just you couldn't match them. They're inconclusive. The, my results of those um, comparisons were inconclusive, yes sir. Okay. And then you also in your report reach the same um, you you conclude that it's inconclusive on whether item 33 states exhibit 88 um, are you saying it's inconclusive whether item 33 exhibit 88 fired two through seven that's correct are you saying it's inconclusive as to whether item 33, which is exhibit states 88, um, at some point in time, loaded and ejected, extracted from item 33? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Well, we just talked about there's a difference between firing and then cyc cycling and <coughs> extracting. Yes, sir. Tool marks. Yes, sir. Did, did you look at, did you look at, States Exhibit 88 to see if the extraction marks max, matched up to items two through seven? Um, based on the evidence that I received, um, I was able to determine that items two through seven um, had those matching mechanism marks with um, items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116 through 117, and 122 um, to conclude that those items have been loaded into, extracted and ejected. Sorry about that. From the same firearm at some previous time. But you can't identify the fire, the firing, the firearm, the gun. Um, right, correct. In terms of being fired by, I was able to determine that several items had been fired by that rifle, and the results of those comparisons um, with the other items, slid items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, 122 through 124 and 128. Um, those comparisons with each other in those test cartridge cases fired by the item 33 rifle were inconclusive. And so, um, let's see if I can understand what you're talking about with regard to your conclusions on that items two through seven, which were shell casings found at near Maggie's body and other spent cartridges found around the Moselle house and at the shooting range, you conclude that they were loaded into, extracted, and ejected 
from the same firearm at some previous time. That's correct. And for those, I, I guess we have the same issue. You, you looked at the primer, the breech marks on the primer, and you couldn't make any conclusions on those, right? When I looked at the, um, the primer area where those breech face and firing pin impressions are, um, the results of, of including that in a fire by result were inconclusive. Um, and that, that is the results for items two through seven, and 35 through 37, 39, 108, 111 through 120, 122 through 124 and 128. And, and again, aren't the breech marks in the firing pin, aren't those more reliable than extractor marks when you're doing an analysis? Um, during the, the marking of these specimens, if you will, through firing, um, the machining process to, to create those firearms, um, we, we see tool marks on fire cartridge cases and fire bullets um, from multiple different processes. Um, I can't say that one's more reliable to mark than the other. Um, it's, it's all due to the machining process and also um, due to the individual wear and tear of that firearm through use of it um, and repetitive use or abuse of the firearm. That can also add to the markings in each or of those locations that we're looking at, whether it be something from the breech face from the firing pin, um, those extractors and ejectors, or even the rifling in the barrel, all of those um, variables can play into those markings and, um, and how we see those and how they reproduce on our evidence and how um, individual they are to each gun. Well, that, that does bring me to another point. It, isn't your opinion based upon conclusion that every 300 blackout manufactured in the world, whether it's put together by John Bedingfield or mass assembled at Palmetto State Armory or anywhere in the world that each one, when they um, cycle a bullet through and eject it, will produce its own unique, like no other in the world, its own unique tool mark. Isn't that, isn't that what your opinion is based on? Again, during the, the manufacturing of, of these um, components. Is that, is that a yes or no? Um, I would like to explain it a little more. Your Honor, can possible. I get a yes or no and then an explanation? Your Honor, I'm objecting. You can answer the question. Restate the question. Is it your opinion based upon the, the presumption or the or the basis of your opinion is that every 300 blackout manufacturer in the world produces its own unique set of tool marks when it cycles a bullet through? Yes or no? Uh, I would like to answer that with a little bit of explanation if possible. Your Honor, I would appreciate a yes or no, and he can explain all day long. If you can answer yes or no, you must answer yes or no, then explain. Can you repeat the question one more time? I apologize. Is it your opinion, in this case, about the shell cartridges being fired from the same 300 blackout? Isn't that based upon your presumption that each 300 blackout manufacturer in the world makes unique tool marks when it cycles a bullet and ejects it? And it, it's hard to say, I have not looked at every 300 blackout um, that's in the world, so it's hard to answer that question, but, but again, based on my, my knowledge of, of that process and how they're made, I'm able to, to support my answer um, without but, answering it uh, in a yes or no manner, I suppose. But, but you're saying you, you, you found shells here, shells, cartridges here, cartridges there, cartridges at the murder scene, and, and they all have uh, very, I mean, it, not all the marks are identical, but enough marks are close enough to being identical. In your opinion, they were fired by one weapon in the world. Um, it's my opinion that those um, had all been cycled through the same firearm at one point in time. Yes, sir. Um, but not fired by the same firearm. Uh, no, sir, that's not what my, my, uh, my conclusions say. Um, 
the, as far as being fired by that firearm or by the same gun, uh, those results are inconclusive. So that means that the markings on the breech, because they were all fired, they all have a fire pin hitting the primer, and you call that breech markings, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Those are breech face markings um, that we would see on the primer. And there were dissimilar dissimilarities between those where you couldn't reach a conclusion. That's correct. Those uh, shared, again, those same class characteristics. Um, so we, were, we compared those to each other. Um, based on our comparisons, um, that's correct. There were not enough, um, there's not enough agreement. There was insufficient agreement there for me to reach a conclusion um, based on uh, my training and experience and looking at all of these cartridge cases that I could say that they were um, fired by the same firearm. And that's how we arrived at that conclusion. And um, can you say when those um, two markings were made on the, or when the, scratch that. Is there any way to determine, for you to determine, uh, um, when the shell casings, cartridges, were cycled and ejected in this one firearm that's unique to all others in the world? Like, I, can, I cannot date um, when those were fired or when those were loaded into or extracted and ejected from a firearm, no sir. I cannot put a, a time stamp, if you will, on that, no sir. And, and you can't state whether it was a 300 blackout assembled in um, 2016 given a for Christmas gift or if it was a replacement given in 2017 or 2018. I mean, you don't know what year the gun was that cycled and ejected? That's correct. I do not have knowledge on the year of manufacture of these firearms. Okay. Now let's move on to the um, shotguns. And you were, uh, clear a few things up. You were, you were shown a lot of, um, Items that were taken, un unfired shot shells, and this is 12 gauge. I'm going to show you exhibit 143, 144, 145, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to 50. And I'm, I'm not going to ask you to take these out, but, but I want you to um, take a look at all those. and. Tell me when those were seized or taken in the evidence in this case. Um, I do see a date on the packaging. Um, some of these packages are ripped right through it. Um, that states 9-13-21. Okay. And so you, you understand that is June, July, July, three months after these murders, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that uh, September 13th would be several months after the murder, yes, sir. And that those were seized at different places around the property? Uh, yes, sir, according to uh, the information here, um, it appears they were from, from different locations um, that, and where they were collected from, yes, sir. Okay. And, um, and I guess you don't know whether, I mean, the property of Moselle was open to Alec Murdoch I mean, from June till September, as far as you know, right? I have no knowledge of, of that, no sir. And if he had the mind to, he could go out and remove it. Every, every shotgun shell on the whole property, right? I, I have no knowledge of how the, uh, the scene was maintained. Right. Well, it would appear that no one removed any shotgun shells since you have them there in your lap, right? Um, it, it does appear that these were collected um, 
from these areas listed on the package on September 13, or I assume as September 13 as it's dated um, and labeled by the uh, the person who collected these. Okay. Um, let me show you. Exhibit 63 and 60, and what I marked is Exhibit 63 and 64. And these are pages 51 and 55 from your report. And will you just confirm this for me? 63, 64, pages 54. One and fifty five from your report. Um, yes, sir, I do recognize um, Defendant's Exhibit 63 um, appears to be a copy of uh, an Item 10 worksheet for the um, fired shot shell. And Defendant's Exhibit 64 um, appears to be a copy of my worksheet for sled item 14, which were uh, 24 birdshot pellets. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to introduce in the evidence Defendant 63 and 64 in this time. Okay. And, and just, uh, Doug, if you pull up 63, which is page 51 of the report, and, and Agent Greer, we tell the jury. Um, what this is? Uh, yes, this is just a copy of one of our standard worksheets that we use to document evidence in the laboratory. Um, so this is an ammunition and cartridge case worksheet, which is why I utilized it when I was um, documenting the item 10 uh, fired shot shell. And this contains um, my notes that I took on that, that item. Okay, and, and just so that we're clear, are we talking about exhibit 33, this is the black colored shot shell that was found in the feed room where Paul Murdoch was murdered? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. Um, State Exhibit 33 is uh, the item we're discussing. And and you, you have a name under notes. It says on shot shell, it says, quote, dry lock, three inch, two. You see that? Yes, sir, I do. You see that, Doug? Can you highlight that? Thank you. And, um, and again, um, the exhibit there, it, and that's what you're talking about, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. And uh, number two is the size of the pellet? Uh, yes, sir, that would uh, refer to the size of the, the pellets or birdshot that, was, um, that we would believe to have been loaded into that cartridge, or that shot shell, excuse me. Okay. And then um, if you'll go to exhibit 64, page 55, Doug, and it's 55 in, in your report, um, Agent Greer. And are these the um, pellets that were provided to you to an, analyze the, the number two size pellets? Uh, yes, sir. Sled item 14, um, I determined to be 24 birdshot pellets, and those were listed as um, being from dog food storage room. Okay. And, and if you look at under the caliber, it says number two, and it says steel. These were steel pellets, were they not? Uh, based on my uh, examination and based on uh, my observation, um, yes, sir, they were magnetic. Um, so that would, uh, that would provide that they had some steel in them, yes, sir. And, um, 
and birdshot can either be steel or lead, I suspect. Maybe there's a third kind. Um, there, there can be multiple different um, metals used in, in making pellets. Um, lead is, is one, steel is one. There's, there are also other metals that can be used um, in making pellets, yes, sir. Have you analyzed any of the um, Winchester dry lots that were seized in September of 2021 to see whether they're steel or lead? No, sir, I have not um, analyzed the, their contents. Okay. Now, here you've got um, Exhibit 64. Uh, you've got grain weight. And I'm, why don't you explain um, what you're referring to? Oh, I, I, I guess I needed, um, I'm missing a page for that. So if, if you'll if you look, look at your page 54 in your file, because I've, it says continued from Wade, and, and I guess that's on page 54, is that right? Um, no, sir, that's just referencing from the weight category that's um, kind of at the top portion of the page. Okay. Um, I just continued my thoughts down below. Well, so help me out here. You say there's five pellets weighed 3.4 grams, and then 18 pellets only weighed 3.6 grams. How, how does that work? Um, I weighed each of those pellets individually. And again, we're weighing in grains. And um, when I weighed those on our scale, um, that is what I documented. Five of them weighed 3.4, and that should be um, a piece. Um, 18 of them e each weighed 3.6 grains, and one pellet weighed 3.8 grains. Okay. So the, the total of them all together was um, approximately 86.4 grains. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, you also weighed the grains of, um, of the 300 blackout projectiles. And you don't have that in front of, a, front of us right here, but did you not weigh the grains there? Uh, yes, sir, I did. And if you've got it, just tell us what they were. I have my notes here. I believe you said 147 grains. States Exhibit 50 which is your item eight on your report? Uh, yes, sir. When I weighed sled item eight, which was one fired bullet, um, it was approximately 147.4 grains. And are you familiar with how 300 blackout ammunition is sold, what weight classes there are? Um, I don't know all of the, the weight, different weights uh, that are within that caliber, no, sir. Do you know there's like a subsonic and then supersonic? Um, Again, I don't know everything about that caliber. Um, there are various weights that bullets are sold in for each caliber, um, so I would not be surprised uh, at other grain weights, but I don't know um, all of them off the top of my head today. So you, I mean, as far as you know, the only weight you could ever get is 147 grains, right? Um, the, I, when I weighed these items, item 8 and item 12, um, they weighed approximately 147. You mentioned in your testimony that um, item 32, which is Exhibit 91, had a Winchester and a Federal 12-gauge um, shotgun shells in here. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, sir, they did have um, two unfired 12-gauge shot shells submitted with it. That's correct. But you did more than that when you testified shortly ago. You said one was a Winchester and one was a Federal, I believe. Uh, yes, sir. One is a Federal uh, premium heavyweight TSS, and one is a 12-gauge uh, Winchester long beard XR, I believe. Oh. The Winchester is not a dry lock, correct? Um, no, sir. The, the markings on, on that shell said a long beard XR. Okay. And 
Um, the Winchester found the murder scene is a dry lock, correct? Uh, the item. The 10 shot shell, which was recovered from Marker 10, which um, I do believe, my understanding is that around the, the body of Margaret Murdoch was a Winchester 12 gauge shell, um, and it says dry lock on it. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. And then item 22, which is the gun that Alec Murdoch, Murdoch came down, was holding or was leaning up against his suburban when. Deputy Daniel Green arrived. Um, that was, as you understand, loaded with a 12 gauge and a 16 gauge shell, uh, correct? When I received it, um, it was unloaded, um, but I did receive a 12 gauge shell and a 16 gauge shell, that's correct. And if you fire a 16 gauge shell and a 12 gauge shotgun, what's likely to happen? Um, that's something that I have not uh, done. Um, so I'm unable to answer that question. Is it dangerous to do such a thing? Um, as a firearms examiner, I would recommend um, shooting the ammo that your firearm is chambered for. Um, I can't predict what would happen if you shot that shot shell or attempted to. All right. You, you spoke of this uh, review process at SLED with regard to, to your tool mark analysis, and, and, and you said you, you do your analysis, you look at things under a microscope, and you type up a report? Uh, yes, sir. I look at um, the evidence, um, reach a conclusion, and, and write or type those conclusions. Yes, sir. And then a reviewer, someone, um, and in this case, what was the name, initial CW? Um, the reviewer was uh, Chad Smith, another examiner within our department. I, is he uh, uh, on the same level of, with you at SLED? Um, he is also um, an examiner. Um, I don't know his classification, but he has been employed in the department um, longer than I have uh, completing firearms examination. Okay. And and then he, he looks at it, but does he prepare an independent report and then flips the two over and see if they match, or does he just take a look at it, come up with his thoughts, and then look at your document to see if he agrees with it? Um, he does not prepare an independent report, um, no. He does look at the evidence and arrive at those conclusions, um, and, and then he would read my, my results. If he agrees with them, um, then he will sign off on those conclusions. If he disagrees with them, um, then there's also a, a procedure for that to, to happen. Now, now, you mentioned that in order to make an identification or a match, or do you have to have a certain number of similar or, is it similar or identical characteristics? Um, in order to make an identification, we want to see uh, sufficient agreement between the, char the individual characteristics. Um, there's not a certain number um, that I use as we use a, a, a series, or excuse me, a method called pattern matching. And we're looking at, under the microscope, all these tiny striations and impressions and looking at the surface contours of those two tool marks with each other. And we're looking at those individual peaks and ridges and comparing those under high magnification in order to, to make an identification. Um, and based on that, um, through our training and, and experience at doing this job, we look at thousands of, of comparisons, and er, excuse me, conduct thousands of comparisons. Um, during that time, we, we look at things that match each other that we know um, have been fired from the same gun or made by the same tool, and we look at things that have been um, fired by separate guns and see if there's any agreement or disagreement. And we look at thousands of these uh, cartridge cases and bullets and tool marks in order to um, to learn what that sufficient agreement um, is to make our identification. Okay, and you, you, you gave this jury an analogy like a ladder and that you have to get up so many steps as you reach. The first step, I guess, would be rifle or shotgun, right? And then the second step would be 
caliber of rifle, if we're talking about a rifle, and then you keep going up the ladder. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. We're going to look at those class characteristics. So we're going to determine if, you know, one, if they're the same caliber. Um, do they share the same rifling specifications if they're a fired bullet? Um, if they are, then we can compare those. If, for instance, if a bullet has five lands and groove and it's going to the right, and we compare that to another bullet that has six lands and grooves and it's uh, going to the left, then we know those did not come out the same barrel. So there's no need to do it in a, any type of comparison there. Um, however, if we look at two that have those same uh, lands and grooves, those five lands and grooves, and they're all going to the right, they're the same caliber, then, then we'll go up that ladder, if you will, and compare those um, individual characteristics to see um, if they were fired by the same firearm or not. Tell this jury how many steps of that ladder you have to go up before you can make an identification. As far as making an identification, um, it's based on the marks that what we see um, under the microscope. Um, when we're looking at all of these marks, we want to see that sufficient agreement. Again, um, we want to see enough agreement so that what is there is better than anything, any agreement that we've seen in tool marks that have been created by different tools. And that's, um, that's learned on the job, doing this, um, doing practicals that I did in training, looking at thousands of comparisons of things that I've test fired, um, that I know were fired from the same gun, looking at things that I've test fired from different guns and looking at that. Um, it's also um, done through studies that I participated in training. I'm looking at things that, that help us know what that sufficient agreement is within all of those features and looking at the totality of those markings. So we're not going to base our opinion just on one little mark. We're going to look at the entire surface area of that bullet, the entire surface area of that cartridge case in order to, to make our conclusion. Um, we're, not, we're not looking at one little mark and making an identification. Um, so we have to think of the totality of all the markings that we see under the microscope. So the short answer to my question, there is no set number of steps on the ladder you have to reach before you can make your decision? Um, we use a, a pattern, or excuse me, a method of pattern matching again, and that's how we do it. And that's a widely accepted uh, method throughout all firearms examiners um, in the United States and the world, really. Um, that's, that's what we've been using for years to complete um, firearms identification, and, and that's what's been widely accepted, looking at these patterns and, and comparing them in order to to make our identification and reach our conclusion. Well, now you say it's been widely accepted, but isn't it true that um, that that your field of expertise has become under criticism by the the uh, the scientific community? Um, there there has been criticism, but again, there's been uh, research completed um, to 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 support firearms identification, if you will. Well, I mean, the National Academy of Scientists issued a report and was pretty critical of the objectivity of your work, that it is more subjective because you don't have a set number of ladder, um, rings on a ladder you got to reach. It's, it's based upon your experience, your training, and your opinion. But there's no objective criteria by which to measure whether something matches or not. Isn't that you're aware of that criticism by the National Academy of Scientists, right? I'm aware of, of some of the criticism, yes, sir. Um, however, the, subject, the, the process of making the identification is subjective in nature, but it's based on some objective data that we're looking at. Um, so it, there's, again, lots of information that we're looking at, those, the contours of those tool marks, the individual peaks and ridges of those tool marks, and looking at it, it's not, it's not just looking to see um, is, that, is this a match and it looks good. We're really uh, looking in under high magnification at all of these features to see um, what agreement or disagreement that, that we can uh, determine. And again, that's based on some objectivity you know, of how we arrived to, to that situation. But, but you agree that, that your chosen field is, is part art as much as science, right? Um, our field is an applied science, um, really. Um, we, we do use um, lighting and angles to look at these features under the microscope, and it's important to know how to, to, um, 
move those items around and move those lighting and that, those um, different stages on our microscope in order to see some of these markings. I mean, it can be difficult to do, and, and there is a, a special technique that you know you have to learn in looking at this and doing it and using that microscope to to really become um, familiar and, and efficient. Do you agree with me previously in this courtroom, under oath, that 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 this profession you're in is part art? Um, there, there is some art to it, and that's just the lighting thing. Um, for example, you know, we, we have to look at that and we have to um, use that oblique lighting in order to make some of those striations show up. Um, again, these are tiny little marks that we're looking at, um, that we're looking at mon under magnification. Um, but the field itself is, is not art, it's an applied science. We're using um, scientific processes to, to reach these conclusions, excuse me, these conclusions. Um, with years of research to, to support it. You first examine, um, I, you first examine item 22 back in June of 2021, correct? Which is, yes. Which is the rifle, the shotgun that Alec Murdoch had that was taken by Deputy Green, right? Uh, yes, sir. Item 22 was a Benelli model Super Black Eagle, and I, I did receive that item in June. Yes, sir. And when did you receive? I'm not going to pick it up again, but I dropped it, at, and it's almost past five o'clock on a Friday. I don't want to create a, a bit more of a delay. But when did you receive the 300 blackout? Uh, is that the item 33 rifle? Yes, sir. Referring to. Um, I received item 33, which was um, inside sled container K on June 10th. And, and when did you uh, issue your preliminary opinions to on item 33 and item 22 to, to your agency, SLED? Um. I released um, some results to to our agents and investigators on June tenth. June tenth, yes, sir. Are you aware after June tenth that sled dive teams have been going out Collin County, diving the waters, trying to find murder weapons? Um, I'm not aware of what all our dive teams were doing. No, sir. Well, you certainly didn't report to the folks who were relying on your work that we found the murder weapons, did you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You didn't answer? report to the folks at SLED who rely upon your analysis that, hey, Eureka, we got the murder weapons. Um, no, sir, um, that's not what I reported. Okay. And you've never received any projectiles from the shooting range at Moselle to compare. Jason, to Your Honor, asked an answer. I haven't asked my question yet. Have you ever received any projectiles from the shooting range at Moselle uh, to compare to the uh, projectile item number eight? Possibly, but you can answer it. Again, yes, sir. if you've answered it before. Um, based on my understanding of the scene, I do not believe I received any projectiles from that shooting area. Um, and, but that's based on my understanding of, of where I believe the other projectiles are recovered from. When, when you got item 22, the shotgun, did, do you know whether it had been swabbed on the inside of the barrel? Um, I believe it had been processed by other departments. Um, however, I, I do not know what those swabs entailed. If, if a shotgun has been recently fired, does it leave evidence in the barrel that soot stuff? Um, yes, sir. It's possible that we would see um, some type of residue from firing in that barrel. And are, are you aware that Agent Worley swabbed the top before she removed the 16-gauge shell from it? 
Uh, no, sir, I do not know what Agent Worley did in this investigation. Can you see residue with the naked eye of a shotgun that has just recently been fired? Um, sometimes, yes, sir. And that is something that we um, also document as part of our examination of the firearm. Um, and when I looked into the, the barrel and looked down the bore of the item 22 shotgun, I do have in my case file circled that I noticed some fouling or residue in the barrel. Uh, was it recent fouling or residue, or was it a just a dirty gun. Um, I do not. I can't date when that fouling was placed there. That was residue. That residue was placed there. No, sir. I can't put a time on that. What about the 300 blackout? Was it? I think you have a note that's some fouling there, but maybe I'm confusing it. Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. On the, um, the item 33 rifle, I did note that there was some fouling or residues in that barrel. The the opinion that you have provided this court as to the shell casings from the murder scene, which are items, sled items two through seven, and that your opinion is that they were loaded into, extracted, e extracted and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time with items 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116, 17, and 122, and those are shell casings that were found around the house and at, at the shooting range. Your opinion that they were that they were loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm. Are you do you hold that opinion with 100% certainty? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that is my opinion. Um, that is the conclusion that I reached. Did you ever tell Agent Owen that? You could not forensically state with 100% certainty? Uh, no, sir. When I arrived at that conclusion, that was my conclusion. Um, and it was also agreed upon by the um, reviewing examiner. So if there's a note in Agent Owen's report that you couldn't reach it with 100% certainty, then someone has made a mistake? Um, I don't know uh, the contents of Agent Owen's report. No. Greer, I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 400. Could you kindly review that very, very quickly and let me know if you're familiar with what it is? Uh, yes, sir. What is it? Um, this appears to be a copy of my report. Okay. It's an accurate and complete copy of your report? Uh, yes, sir. It does appear to be. Uh, all the things we just discussed today? Yes, sir. Okay. 
State would move to admit item four, uh, State's Exhibit 400, I, I believe, about it. Okay. Mr. Group, please, you know, because some of the questions concerned uh, your field, um, please tell us how, how long has firearms identification and tool mark identification, how long has it been around? Um, in its current form, um, I would say the early 1900s is when this really um, became popular and firearms identification was born um, with several um, important cases. Um, it was as early as the 1900s that they started looking at this evidence and looking at those individual characteristics um, through uh, microscopy. Um, so ever since that time, um, it's just evolved and, um, and grew with further research and support, advances in um, technology, and, um, but it's been around for, for several years. And are you familiar with any studies that were done um, utilizing uh, what would be called consecutive barrels yes, of firearms? Sir. Explain to us what a consecutive barrel study would be and what they, uh, what's done in those. Sure. Um, when we're looking at those characteristics under the microscope um, that were imparted onto a fire bullet or, a per, um, excuse me, a fire bullet or a cartridge case, um, we're looking at all those tiny little features. Um, a consecutively manufactured uh, study takes into the account of the manufacturing process. Um, so all those marks that we discussed are, are coming at, from that gun being produced at a ma by a manufacturer. Metal scraping and removing uh, metal. Uh, so we have tools cutting and tool stamping and, um, and really working on hard metal surfaces. Um, so when we look at a study that has consecutively manufactured things, um, that presents an opportunity for a worst case scenario for us as examiners. If those tools were going to leave markings on um, other firearms, so if you had this breech face being made by the tool and it made the next one, it made the next one, those are consecutively manufactured. If there's any carryover of those characteristics from one to another, um, that's what that study does. It, it, highlights that and it puts that as an emphasis as part of that study. And we as examiners are looking at that, that's our worst case scenario. If we're going to see any carryover of that tool making that, that item or that breech face, uh, we would expect to see marks. Um, there are several studies that are out there and I've participated in several of those as part of my training um, where we're given samples that have been fired by consecutively manufactured barrels. So if we see any agreement between each of those barrels, we should see it there. <coughs> or um, studies where we have consecutively manufactured breech faces. Again, those are breech faces made by the same tool, one right after another. And if we see agreement in there, we should see it in that study. Um, I've participated in those studies, my, uh, excuse me, in those, um, those research projects. Some of them have been studies prior to me becoming an examiner. And I was able to clearly distinguish and accurately distinguish between those projectiles. So I was able to determine um, those projectiles were fired by this barrel, this barrel, this barrel, and this barrel, or that cartridge case was fired by this gun with that breech face, this gun with that breech face, and this gun with that breech face. Um, so we are aware of that in our community, and we do things to um, be proactive on that. And, and that's just an example, um, and, and that's something I participated in and was able to um, successfully pass as part of my competency in determining um, what was fired by what in those companions consecutively manufactured studies. And, those were, and you were able to compare firearms that you know were consecutively manufactured one after the other right after the other. That is correct. And uh, just for clarity, <clears throat> we're talking about, I, I'm referring to items uh, 33 and 22 on your report. That would be the uh, item 33 being the uh, blackout rifle and then item 22 on the camouflage Super Black Eagle 3. Yes, sir. Um, your results for some of those were, when you say inconclusive, that, that, th what does that mean? Does that mean that they could have been fired or that they, you, you just can't determine? Uh, that's correct. Um, inconclusive is a, one of our conclusions that we can issue when there's not enough agreement or disagreement there in those uh, tiny microscopic characteristics. Um, so what inconclusive means is it's possible it could have been fired by that gun and it's possible that it may not have been fired by that gun. to states, uh, to your item number 165, states exhibit 147. Remind us again what that item is. 
Um, could I see item 165? You make me find it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. If you have it, um, no, sir, I'm not sure that I'll be able to find it. Entered into evidence of states 147. That would be sled item 165. Yes, sir. Did you identify what it is again and where it was located when it was found? More importantly. Uh, yes, sir. This was a Winchester 12-gauge uh, shot shell. Um, and on the side of the shot shell, it's stamped dry lot 3-inch 2. On the packaging for uh, States Exhibit 147, it says from nightstand in Paul's um, room. Now, I know Council asked you a question about, you know, your field being an applied science. Just so we understand what an applied science is, are there any other examples of fields that are applied in that general realm of applied sciences? Uh, yes, sir. A lot of, of what we do as firearms examiner is learned um, through our process of training and looking at samples and learning the job. It's kind of like, um, if you will, a physician. Um, they go to school. Um, they learn a lot in their medical uh, school, but they still do a residency program, if you will. So they're on the job, doing on the job training. Comparing his, what he does to. Objection overruled. Please continue. Yes, sir. Um, so they learn things in school. Um, the firearms identification is not something that you can necessarily go to a school and learn to do. Um, you can't get a four-year degree and become a firearms examiner the next day. Um, there are universities across the nation that have for firearms identification as part of their firearms program, and they're teaching that component. But in order to um, achieve your competency at this, um, you, you need on-the-job training. You need the experience um, in, in looking at these samples and knowing how to evaluate uh, the markings that we're looking at on these um, ammunition components. Lastly, um, Agent Greer, uh, Mr. Greer, I'm going to ref defer, uh, refer you to State's Exhibit 400. I'm going to put that on the screen. I'm going to direct your attention to item 128. Can you see that on your screen, Mr. Greer? Yes, sir, I can. Specifically, your findings. Concerning two through seven, you see where my pen's pointing? Yes, sir, I do. Which items were two through seven? Um, those were from markers two, three, four, five, six, and seven, respectively. And from my understanding of the crime scene, those were the ones um, that were located around um, Mar Margaret Murdoch's body. Okay. And again, we're on what, what page now, Mr. Greer? Um, that's on page seven. Yes, sir. Okay. Items two through seven found around Maggie's body. Items 35 through 37 and 39, where were those located? Um, those were from the side entrance door, which would be the door, um, I believe, coming out of the, the gun room area. And items 108, 113, 116 through 17, and 122, where were those located? Um, those were from various areas, um, thought to be from the shoot field or from the field. And tell me again what they, what your conclusion was. Um, I was able to determine that uh, based on matching characteristics in the mechanism marks that items 2 through 7, 35 through 37, 39, 108, 113, 116 through 117, and 122 had all been loaded into, extracted, and ejected from the same firearm at some previous time. Nothing further. Thank you. Further examination. 
No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. You may step down.